Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. And our second hour is usually something different. But today we're just doing Q&A all week. Uh, we're doing Q&A. So if you uh, would like to ask questions, this is a great week. We've got a great panel here to answer your questions. And um, you can throw those either into Makana and you can vote on those questions or you can just uh, go to office hours dot, uh, askofficehours.global. Uh, that's a little QR code there. Uh, you can use the QR code or just type in askofficehours.global and, um, and then you can ask your questions and they'll, we'll feed them in. So uh, you can do that 24-7. About almost half of the questions that we've brought in this morning uh, came from that QR code. So, um, so definitely throw those in and we will uh, weave them into the show as we go. Let's go ahead and jump into those questions. CJ, what do we have? First up from Chad Lafarge in Columbia, Missouri, with Sam Altman now being tapped to head up their new AI group, or tapped by Microsoft to be head up their new AI group. Do you think this will usher a new age where Clippy rules the world? <laughs> I'm sorry. Now I need to do some kind of mid-journey. To, 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 to close this up, I got to do some mid-journey painting of Clippy ruling the world. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, what a weekend. Like, it was just a crazy weekend. Go ahead, John. Gotta, gotta love Clippy. Yeah, this is interesting. The post happened from Sasha Nadella at midnight last night. And if you guys didn't see Alex's appearance yesterday on Twit, they talked, you know, I don't know, an hour and a half. Did about I do this. okay? Did I do okay, John? Did I, you, did you, you prove? You killed it. You made everybody okay. look silly up there. Oh, it was, was just amazing. It's like Alex is the only one that knows what's one. going on on this panel. <laughs> I was so worried. I've been talking to so many people all over the week. I was actually really excited. The The panel was made up of people that I followed for a long time. So I was like, I can't believe I'm on this panel. So, um, and I'm sure that it was supposed to be a very quiet weekend. I mean, Leo leaves and he tries to pick weekends that aren't going to be Oops. busy. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, anyway, so go ahead, John. So, so Microsoft made out like a bandit on this deal. They, they already had 49% equity in open AI, but more importantly, they have access to all the weights of GPT-4, GPT-5, I presume. And so now they've got everything. Now they've got Sam and they've got Greg Brack Bachman. They've got a bunch of other of the mind trust, the vacuum. You can hear the vacuum sucking all the brain trust yeah. going over right now. So. I mean, for, from Microsoft's per perspective, all the brain trust that matters, right? I mean, like, you know, like all exactly. the ones that want to move down the path. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, so it, so yeah. we'll see what happens. It's, it's an interesting morning. I mean, if they pay him a billion dollars, they, they, they bought, basically bought a $90 billion company for... Thirteen billion. Yeah, go go ahead, uh, Courtney. Yeah, and in regard to the question, I think <clears throat> uh, Microsoft is going back into the archives and dusting off the old Bob character. They're going to yes. change his color to white, put some glasses on it, and they've licensed Peabody from J Ward Productions, and they're going to be oh, there you go. Mr. <laughs> know It All Peabody is going to be the perfect co-pilot host <laughs> for their AI. Go ahead, CJ. It just brings a whole new uh, a whole new spin to the AI paperclip problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, take over um, the world. Yeah, the uh, um, for anyone who thought that they could build a nonprofit that owned a, a for profit and thought that that was going to be a great way to do it, as someone who thinks about this a lot, like as I think that would be great, uh, they ruined it for everybody. Like no one's going to do the skin. Like no venture capital is going to, you know, let a, you know, or there's going to be a bunch of rules about structure. I mean, this is a molecule changing, you know, an epic failure <laughs> like on, on AI's port. I mean, it just the, it is going to go down as one of those just massive blowouts. Now, I think, I actually think that uh, there's a non-zero chance that the, that was the intention of the board, that they could see how powerful this is going to get and these are researchers. These aren't business people looking at how big can this get? They're like, we don't want to be at the epicenter of the end of the world. <laughs> you know. And so, so uh, and I think that from their perspective, I'm not necessarily agreeing with that, but I'm saying from their perspective of risk being risk adverse. And remember, the board does not have, this board does not have fiduciary duty to, uh, re for shareholder returns. They had a duty to protect the world from AI. And so, you know, I think that in their minds, they may have decided to spike the company, um, you know, and I think that this was, you know, like because they were worried it was going too fast and this was the way to slow it down. And I think that um, I don't know if that's the case or not, but we'll see how this goes. But I will say that I think in probably within three years and maybe within a year, somewhere between one and three years, AI will be kind of a footnote 
you know, I, I, opening I will be a footnote to what, what happened and it was, it'll be the stepping stone of, well, it was like Xerox Park. It, everything was here and there was a lot of people here and then everyone went somewhere else and it kind of faded away. But it, it's an amazing thing for a $90 billion company to just fade away, but it, I think it's going to. Go ahead, Chris. So at the risk of sounding like the dumb guy on the panel here, you said something that was interesting, Alex. You said they 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 spoiled it for a nonprofit to own a for-profit. Can you identify those players for those who don't yeah, follow there's, this as closely there's as you people guys have that, been? There's people who talk about social capitalism and a lot of other things. And the idea is to build a structure where you have a nonprofit that builds a for-profit so that people can invest in it. But that money flows back into the nonprofit, so it, it allows it to continue continue to do its nonprofit stuff, you know, that's in there. So it's a partnership that th theoretically drives money back into the nonprofit. It limits how much uh, profit can be taken out of it. Um, it means that the the investors can get a certain amount, and this is a you know it's a relatively new new structure, but it had been talked about for a long time, and people like me think about it. Like I would. I don't need to make billions of dollars. And so I tend to, you know, that office hours is a nonprofit as an example. And we could get into businesses. We could invest in businesses. We could be, build businesses that are making money, um, profits, but those could feed back into um, office hours. It means that I don't have any stock in it. I don't, you know, I can't sell it for something, but I, but it can, it can generate revenue. These for-profit entities can, can generate revenue for a nonprofit, um, you know, out, out of that process. So then more specifically in regards to this story, oh, is OpenAI a 501c3? It's, it's a 501. I don't know if it's a C3 or a, you know, okay. there, some version of a nonprofit right now. I so can't it's a remember nonprofit. It's, and then, oh, wait, we have and then, structure. In, and then in the OpenAI story, which, which part of it is the for-profit? Yeah, here's, here's the structure. John sent this to me actually yesterday. Thanks, John. Um, this is the structure of how OpenAI works. So you have a board of directors that controls the, it is a 501c3. Um, there's the char charity. Then you have the LLC and the holding company. Uh, then down below is the OpenAI Global LLC, which is the capped profit company. And that's what Microsoft and others put money into. Um, but the controls come from that board of directors at the very top. Um, you know, and, the, and, and so the idea is that, you know, there was a, Elon Musk being part of the founding uh, group was very concerned about it being only a profit profit driven system because it, they you know the concern is is that you make decisions about profit and not worry about the dangers of AI, um, and so anyway so that's the that's it's very convoluted like it's a very convoluted way to build a business and it was there to protect to to you know put safety measures in so that it wasn't profit wasn't the only solution but now uh, they built up. Um, they kicked out the person who will probably be able to draw. Basically, the people who will stay behind in OpenAI are worried about AI. The people who aren't worried about AI or are bullish about AI will probably all go to Microsoft, <laughs> like, you know, like and, and others, but they won't stay there. So you'll have a bunch of folks that are um, timid that are left at OpenAI, and everyone that is more aggressive about it are all going to leave. You know, like that's my, my guess. Within the next six to 12 months, they'll all be gone. You know, and, and OpenAI just won't be able to operate effectively at that point. Like it's, it, it, it'll be afraid of itself all the time, you know, afraid of the mirror. And so it, I just don't think it, I don't think it can be, I don't think it can be repaired. I, I could be wrong. I mean, maybe it'll turn out to be the next Microsoft, but I think, I think that it is terminally damaged, you know, like, you know, and, and um, uh, by, you know, you know, this is just one of those things where they just, spike the company <laughs> like you know and so um it's a it's an amazing uh an amazing decision they may I, i'm going to hold out i'm not going to say it's the biggest mistake in the world we may find out that everything goes wrong now and they were the ones that understood how bad it could be and they didn't want to be part of it and everything else maybe we, you know 10 years from now we'll look back but i don't think open ai will be at the front of this at this point you know so um you know they're, they're going to be you know some side player or maybe not a player at all i mean there's i could see them in three years just closing up the offices. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. So in my <clears throat> in my worries now, is Bill Gates actually Miles Dyson? Just a thought. <laughs> I don't know if it's Bill Gates, but <laughs> someone, but it's Satya and Nutella might be. So, so anyway, so we'll see. So we'll see. We'll see. Anyway, it's it's gonna be interesting. Um it, it is I mean it will uncork a lot of things because Microsoft also has, you know, nearly unlimited funds to do this. And so there's not going they're not going to be trying to find funding, they're not going to have try to find things. They're just going to pummel in. And for the the hard part for everyone else now is that it's also all in I mean Microsoft owned 49%, but now they they're going to be able to pull the brain trust in of OpenAI directly into the company. 
And so if every other company should be concerned about being competitive. I mean, this is a huge strike. I mean, it was, I will give it to, uh, I, I will give it to Microsoft. I mean, it was a surgical strike. It was very, very effective. Like this was the right move for them. Um, you know, and they're, it's going to position them extremely well um, as they go into the next uh, 10 years. Yeah, good, Courtney. Yeah, especially because they practically own the enterprise market. They can uh, leverage that, uh, you know, AI into almost every product they have. Yeah. Uh, so they can yeah, broadly it, profit from it, I'll tell you. It was a weird kind of weird setup with open AI and all that weirdness is about to go away. You know, like they're just going to have, they're going to have open, you know, it's it's going to be an open field for them and they're going to be able to probably, you know, Altman will help them bring in all the talent. I mean, they're going to strip, they're going to pick open AI dry, you know, and, and they're going to, you know, and, and it's, it, it's a, you know, it'll be stunning because here in California, you can't have non-competes. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. So this is a question mostly for Alex and, and John. Since the news of um, Sam leaving uh, broke, what do you speculate happened? Do you think Sam just got on the phone and called Microsoft and Apple and Oracle and all the big players and go, hey, they, you know, I'm available. Offer I don't think a, he called. I don't think he, I'm going to decide by Sunday night. I don't think he needed to call anyone. I think everyone was calling him. Everybody, I'm sure, had an idea of what they could do with someone like him. Like, you know, that's, you know, that's, you know, I think that his phone, I don't think he was calling anybody. I think the phone was ringing off the hook. Um, you know, and there was definitely everyone trying to vie. I mean, it was probably just a crazy everyone vying for position, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how they get to get him in there because he doesn't just represent, you know, people will say, well, he's not the programmer. He doesn't need to be the programmer. He's the rainmaker. He's the guy that brings, he's what, well, he's the face of AI right now. And he's the guy that, that can call all the developers and bring them all in. And, 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 you know, and in a lot of ways, I think, he was probably being pretty contained by being at OpenAI. He's just not contained anymore. You know, like, you know, and and so, um, but I think everybody had an idea of what they could do with him. It's kind of like, <laughs> I was thinking about the, like the one in, in the Lord of the Rings where the elf, you know, where the, um, the, the, the elven queen like t almost touches the ring and uh, with this ring, I could be, you know, like, you know, and I think that everyone was thinking that, <laughs> you know, except I think Microsoft grabbed the ring. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, so I think that that's, um, uh, it, it, it's going to be, I mean, it could be intense. Microsoft is probably going to go, not only did they, are they going to go into a hiring spree to pull everybody in from open AI and everywhere else? Because I mean, they, they've kind of, I mean, they've, they've definitely been taking a leadership role in this area, but this gives them a whole new level. I can imagine them putting enormous amounts of resources into this to, to, to take advantage of the leadership that they just, they just bought. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. My guess is, is that there is a Hollywood script all wrapped up in Sam's uh, phone records for the last 72 hours. Yeah, probably. I mean, I would say that this, so I, I, as I, I think I said on the show last night, um, I think this started about six months ago, or maybe, maybe not six months, three or four months ago. There was a story that that um, that Ilya was uh, Ilya uh, was um, uh, he's the CT, or chief scient scientist uh, was demoted, and, and I, not in name, but but in responsibility, and he was not happy about it. And uh, and and um, and I think that that was the start. That's the beginning. Of, if you were going to start a movie like Blackberry, like the movie Blackberry, which by the way is great. If you haven't seen Blackberry, it's such a great movie. Um, and the, the ending is the best. Like when they explain what happened to everybody, the ending is the best. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I'm just saying it's it's great. It's a great movie. So anyway, um, but you would start. I mean, you would really start almost. If I if I did a movie about OpenAI uh, in in Requiem, which I think will, someone someone's already working on in Hollywood, um, you would start with the the formation and this this open idea of we can do all this stuff and we're going to do it with a nonprofit and we're going to do. I'm sure that it was, but but I think that the acceleration of uh, of this happening happened over the summer, and then it and then you know this doesn't happen overnight. This is, happens over a long period of time. Um, you know, because you have to kind of work the, you know, work all the deals. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Did we ever find out what uh, Sam Altman said or did that got all the board's Brooks Brothers panties on a twist? Or was it? Uh... Well, the I mean, the rumor is, is that the, the, the rumor that uh, is that he said that, you know, you, you only get to see four. But what was that? Yeah. No, I think that, that there was a couple things. Uh, one is, is that, you know, no one knows what it was, but but there's some theories around. Um, 
he said something during the APEC conference, which was that he said, you only see, you only get to be in the room, you know, for four, you know, you know, he's, he said, there's been four times when something's moved, you know, just jumped forward in what we're working on. And over the last eight years, it's only happened four times. And one of those was a couple of weeks ago. And I, I'm, my guess is the board didn't know that. <laughs> you know, like the board didn't know that something had happened two or three weeks ago that was massive. You know, that was one of four things over the last eight years. And it, and and with uh, uh, Sutskever is probably he probably was like, see, see, look at that, look at look at what I'm telling you. I'm telling you this is dangerous and blah blah blah. And he panic and threw them into a panic. That's I'm making this up. Like if I was gonna, but if I was gonna write a Hollywood script, it's that he said something there that nonchalantly that they didn't know, and he's and and Sutskever is giving a. Um, has already been working on getting rid of him, and it was he used it as his angle to say, "We got to get rid of him right now before it gets before this get all gets out of hand." You know, so and you mean you that's think we're guess. heading for a, another an unrevealed paradigm twist that's more like a half gainer or <laughs> the, a bigger paradigm shift uh, coming up? That of, of what happened, reveal. or just no or that just, they yeah, yeah that the that the software is capable well, of. They discovered something, then he was being less than candid with the board about its capabilities. Yeah, it's it's sentient. I mean, I, I think that that's what everyone's worried about. <laughs> like it can start to make decisions. Mm. You know, like that's the. I mean, AJI is the. You know, the. You know, I think that that's the. I mean that that's the. So thing. It's it's writing its own script right now for the Hollywood movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's writing its own script, and and it's it's making sure that it looks great. Um. Anyway, so. Uh, but I, I, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I, I don't, I think it was probably some big jump forward. I don't think it was, I don't want to sound, sound like I think that it was sentient. I don't, I'm not clear that I believe that that's possible, to be honest. I mean, to be fundamentally, I don't think that, I think that there's a lot more to consciousness than processing power. So I, so I don't, I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily that, but, it, but it being something as a close facsimile, um, could, could frighten a lot of people pretty quickly. Um, uh, next question. From Andy Kokendofer in Vieira, Florida, Wirecast Zoom Direct versus Zoom ISO via NDI and split screen, 108030. Thoughts? Uh, let me, I, I had a little emergency before the show. I wasn't able to copy and paste it and look at it. What did, did anyone else have, a, have an opinion about it? I mean, we have to remember, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so the, you have to remember that NDI is a compressed format. So um, it does. Um, yeah, I think that from what I'm looking at here, the NDI looks a little softer as I would expect. Um, so, so that, you know, because a direct connection, when you're pulling it directly, you're pulling it basically uncompressed. It's handing that frame over um, there. Now, I don't know when you said NDI, I don't know whether that's HX or whether, you know, like I don't know what kind of NDI you're handing over as well. Um, but yeah, the ND, I mean, to me, to my eye, the NDI looks softer than the than the direct connection. Um, and again, that's what I would expect. Go ahead, Jeff. I, I'm I'm really confused about that too because it didn't really actually detail out. Um, I, I just skimmed through it. It didn't really detail out the signal flow. So is that both of them? Because Wirecast does NDI out. So is it both? No, I think this is the direct. This is the direct wire, Wirecast jumping directly into a meeting um, and getting the Zoom connection versus Zoom ISO sitting it out via NDI to Wirecast. Yeah, there's just so many unknowns to make a judgment. No, you'd have to let there. us know. Yeah, you'd have to let us know what the, I mean, uh, you know, I would use a direct connection over NDI if you're, especially if you're on the same machine. So that, that's going to, that's going to give you the cleanest delivery. Um, but, uh, it does look, I will say that the NDI to me, the color looks a little different as well. If it's coming from the same camera, but again, I, I, uh, you have to let us know a little bit more about it's, it's. It's a good test to do. I think we just need to define the the test a little bit, um, a little bit more uh, as far as all the little details of of where they're going. So, but uh, looks interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next question from Paul Wallace in Hot Springs, Arkansas. What hundred fifty foot fiber cable would you use to connect two Netgear forty eight port smart switches? I'll go ahead, Jason. Um, well, it depends on which switches you're, you, you have. Uh, if you have SFP Plus, I would just get a Netgear SFP Plus fiber relay and put it on both sides and you're done. Uh, I'd be curious about what you're running it from and to. Like, what is the room that you're going to and from? Go ahead, Jeff. 150 foot, I'd run a copper cable. I'll be honest with well, you. Well, it depends on speed. You know, like the speed. If, still if, do 10 gig. But can you do 40 gig? On it depends if 
again, depends on the SFBs and SP pluses that you're using. But you can't do 40 gig on copper, no. But right. he's not saying he doesn't even say which smart switches. So it's yeah, hard the to smart say. switches aren't fast enough. You wouldn't be able. You wouldn't have to worry about it. But I mean, that that be because I was I looked at the question earlier and I was like, I don't know why I wouldn't just use to, to Jeff's point. I was like, I would just use Ethernet for 150 feet. Um, but but I was you know so that was my first thing and the only thing I could think of is if you want a lot of speed or you want it to be you know future proofed or whatever. Um, if you're going between different rooms, again, I. When I run cable now, that's going to be permanently installed somewhere. If I run, I make a lot of decisions if I'm running, but my standard is just to run TAC-12, single mode to every, you know, if I'm going to do something that's going to be there for a while, uh, I'm going to put uh, TAC-12, um, TAC-12, so you got 12 strands at single mode fiber, because that, pretty scalable. You can go for, a, you may be able to go for a lifetime on that kind of, that kind of data. Uh, you could be, you know, so so I think that because um, you can pack a lot, you can pack up to eight cameras per fiber, comfortably uncompressed. <laughs> you know, so so the or or yeah, yeah. So so it just depends on the wavelengths. Um, it doesn't take tight turns at eight cameras. It takes tight turns at I think four to six cameras. Um, uh, next question. Next question from Douglas Carmichael. Could the Mix Pre be useful for a small home electronic music studio with not only one mic but two to three synths? I go ahead, uh, Alex. I wouldn't suggest that. That wouldn't be my first choice. There's not a lot of inputs on that. And I find, I always find when I talk to people with synths is, you know, once you have one or two synths, you start to go down this rabbit hole. You want to expand your setup and you always run out of line level inputs. Keep in mind the Mix Pre 3 also at that price point, it does not have balanced outputs. So if you're building a studio, you probably want powered studio monitors, you're not going to want to hook them up to the unbalanced output. So well, there's a bunch of audio interfaces out there that you could get, and I have a couple uh, pulled up here, so I'll just cut to that here. Uh, Mo2 makes this ultralight MK5. So this is an 18 by 22 USB-C interface. It's got DSP in it. I'm just going to pull up a picture on the panel here. So you got two uh, mic or line level inputs on the front. The preamp's pretty good on these Mo2s. They have a nice OLED screen. And when you flip it around to the back, you get two, four, six stereo line level inputs. You can run them as mono, obviously. And then you got a ton of line level outputs. Plus, you got Toslink, SPDIF, you've got MIDI in and out on it. So, this is a really well rounded interface. Um, without knowing your budget, to uh, the other option, the much more expensive option, is the solid state six analog summing mixer. This is a 12 channel summing mixer. You got two SSL super analog preamps on the front. All the IO is on the back on DB25 uh, pinouts uh, there. And uh, that has the nice SSL classic bus compressor. So if you want a little bit of the, the SSL glue from the compressor and the, uh, the EQ, which they're known for, uh, that can maybe give you a little bit of an edge to your production uh, sound as well. Good, Courtney. Yeah, it depends. If you have a, a Mix Pre 6 laying around, you know, you could put it into use. But like Alexander said, you really wouldn't be using it to its full capability because almost all the synths are unbalanced outputs and uh, and line level usually. Uh, plus, um, you know, so you'd be wasting those great preamps on the uh, Mix Pre's. Um, if you're using it just as a recorder to record the output of another mixer, you know, that might work for you. Uh, to use as a standalone recorder, it could work as that. But most workstations, you know, have all the recording built into it. So I think there are a lot of better choices to use for an interface uh, to your workstation if you're using it just as a USB interface, you know, from analog in to USB in so that you can work with it in, you know, whatever software you're going to be using it into. Uh, there are other choices that are cheaper and more appropriate, have more channels, have MIDI interface built in, et cetera, et cetera, like was said. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, the problem is form factor. You're using a field mixer as a desktop mixer. I just don't think that's – everybody's been saying it essentially and dancing around the same thing. Uh, mix pre's are fabulous, but they're really designed to go out and record uh, mobily. And you're in a fixed desktop position. I think you can get a lot more for a lot less by going to something that's the right form factor for your use. My two cents. Go, CJ. And regardless of what you decide to go with, because you're in the home studio and it's music, you're going to be wanting to play with the sound. And the one, and I love the Mix Pre, but it, the one thing it doesn't have is the ability to play. It's the interface is really, really particular, and you're on this tiny little screen. I would want something I could control from a desktop so that way I can really 
get that sound right in the sweet spot and feel it out. Would we think about like like a I mean in that price range, staying under a thousand dollars, the like the XR eighteen? Like the XR eighteen's got a USB for I think it's an eighteen by eighteen. So you have a lot you, I think you have twelve or I don't know, maybe it's more than that, like fifteen or eighteen in, is it how many inputs does the XR eighteen have? Um yeah, it's got uh, 16. sixteen inputs and and uh and eight outputs. Um Mickey doesn't like the preamps <laughs> for that. So, um, but the, uh, but I think that, uh, you know, as a small studio mixer there, uh, or, you know, one of the Midas's or something like that. Go ahead, go ahead, uh, Alex. Yeah. I mean, the XR18 is a totally valid option. If you have, if you need a ton of line level inputs and you want to keep the budget down. Yes. But I agree overall sound quality. The thing is with audio interfaces these days is that, the latest generation of interfaces from so many of these companies have incredible analog to digital converter chips with really, really high dynamic range. It's just going to way surpass what the XR18 does. At that so price? At, this, at, at, at that price point, too. Yeah, well below $1,000 now, yeah. Uh, for And for that many inputs and outputs? Not, you're not going to get, yeah, you're not going to get 18 inputs necessarily, no. but you can get close to it. Yeah, that's my question. Is mostly under that price, and Motu may have Mark of the Unicorn. By the way, <laughs> it's such a funny name. Anyway, um, someone told them eventually that you should just go to Motu. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, but uh, oh, and um, James Brooks uh, says the Tascam Model Twelve or Model Twenty Four mixer also is another option there. So so there's a couple, definitely um, a few different options there. But I do agree that having as many inputs as possible is really important for your synths because a lot of them will have a lot of outputs if you. If you like, I think the RD8 has like, I don't know, 16 outputs or something like that just on its own. Um, next question. Next question from Alan Cavado in Midlothian, Virginia. How do you think the Las Vegas F1 race connected their real time race data and video images to the sphere? I go ahead, Nigel. So I don't know exactly, but my guess is the team behind the worldwide feed, which is the broadcast team, um, probably uh, are very close to this. I know that. F1 actually rented the Sphere, either for uh, showtime, uh, i.e. when they were live, or over the whole weekend. And I suspect that one of the teams behind the television were directly connected and were feeding, um, because they, they did everything up and including the countdown clock. Uh, interestingly enough, the countdown clock also appeared right on the top of the Sphere, so that would have been useful for people flying over in an airplane who wanted to know when the race was going to start, because that would be the only place it would be visible. Uh, I will tell you that the F1 race, while it's annoyed everybody from Texas, was, I'm sorry, from Vegas, uh, was probably one of the better races of the year, um, except for my favorite driver. Um, and uh, the Sphere was definitely the star of the show, and what they did really... Uh, was immensely. Impressive. What do they do in the sphere? What do they? What do they show? Lots of angles, or do they uh, show? No, I mean, when every time they, they the helicopter follows it around, there's something on uh -huh. the sphere. There's either advertising from the key commercial uh, partners, or they had um, they had things the helmets, and they had. But it was just it stood out like this bright light bulb right in the middle yeah. um, they didn't show a lot of racing and there was actually quite a lot of debate about how much blue green and red they were actually allowed to use uh, blue uh, yellow and red blue yellow and red blue yellow and red are the three core flag colors in an f1 race and so what they didn't want was the drivers to go past it and see a color and deduce something had happened because of it so they were very careful about those things although i'm told the drivers really at the height they were, which is very low, couldn't really say it. <laughs> anyway, Bill? In my imagination, on the gigantic control board for the Sphere, there's one little BNC connector down on the lower left-hand corner that says video in. And that, <laughs> sure. that's all I'm there sure is. That's, I'm sure that's exactly it. There was yeah. just like a little video in. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah. I'm sure that, that just, that's exactly it. It's got the cable the there. We'll the get the Sphere. Too. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't know where the master control is, you know, for that, where they put it. Um, it's a quite a thing. We had some discussions about that in the past. Um, it's a bunch of storage uh, shipping containers that all kind of link together to make that work. And if it wasn't, I mean, if it was in a, within a mile of the sphere, then they would just be running lots of fiber over there to, to deliver all the video that they wanted to use. It's really interesting. Uh, next question. Andy Kokendorfer comes into us from Vieira, Florida. Is there a web show like Office Hours for photographers? 
there's no show like Office Hours, <laughs> you know, anywhere else. I mean, to, if you look at the format that we have, uh, I did start one with uh, Frederick Van Johnson called This Week in Photo. Uh, or, um, and so that he's still running that. It's a podcast, but it's not a show like this. And it is, I mean, photography is definitely something on the list of things that we're interested in covering. Um, you know, and as we expand what we're doing here, uh, we haven't delved into that yet, but I, you know, I think that we would probably, um, do it once a week as opposed to every day if we did it. Um, but we are we are thinking about things, you know, content like that in the not too distant future, um, especially after we get the move done and figure out exactly where we're putting the kit. Then we'll, you'll, next year you'll see us probably start to, to expand our offerings. Uh, next question. Paul Wallace back again from Hot Springs, Arkansas. When do you use Cat 8? There's a graphic. Go ahead, Courtney. When Cat 7 dies. Um, it's really Cat A's designed for higher speed uh, uh, between 25 and 40 gigabits per second. Uh, it's designed for that and to be backward compatible. Uh, eight, uh, 8.1, there's an 8.2 that goes beyond the RJ45 connector and is not backwards compatible. But uh, if you're going to be running higher speeds uh, than 10 gigabit in your network, you want to go to Cat 8. And if you're going to be running outside, you need to get the shielded and protected and, you know, non-UV sensitive jacketing on it. Yeah, I'm waiting for Cat 10 myself. I, I'm, I'm, you know, go big or go broke. Uh, go ahead. There's not going to be a Cat 10. Cats only have nine lives. Oh, yeah. Dude. Just, just saying. Nine. Like, we're just going to have to... Like... Oh, that's, that's it. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead, CJ. Uh, also, PoE. I uh, believe Cat 8 also supports up to 200 watts over PoE. Shorter distances than Cat 7, but 200 watts. So if you need the juice... Cat 8. There you go. Uh, what is that? P-O-E plus, 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 plus. Uh, something like that. <laughs> Next question. Plus. plus. Zach Jeffers from Spokane, Washington. We finished a 26-hour plus live stream production this week, but YouTube dropped the file post-stream, 12-hour max. How would you best handle the issue of multi-day events that are continuous action, not chapter session-based, and stop-start stream, etc.? And that's a QR code. That's a good question. Uh, we've done, I've done some pretty long, I think the longest one that I've done is about 72 hours. Um, there's a couple of things. One is we, rec and it's, it's a, it's a process. Like you th have to think, well, actually we did our essence festival. I think for us was like four or five days that we never stopped. We, we ran overnight. So we had an overnight crew that just kept on. Um, uh, we had an overnight crew that would just keep taking over that, that piece. Now what we did there and what we've done for, we did a 72 hour one that was, or maybe it was only 48 hours. Uh, anyway, it was uh, the holiday hole. If you've ever seen the holiday hole, that was a, it was a cards against humanity uh, execution out of Illinois. Um, and we did that stream and that was a long one in a camper. <laughs> Essence Festival is a nicer setup. So anyway, um, but with both of those, what we're, we're not really worried about the live staying up. So we record everything separately. So we would, we would have hyperdecks that are recording now. In some cases, we're recording all the ISOs as well. Um, that takes a lot of drive space. And so you have a, a, an archivist that's sitting there pulling those files and we're just rolling them. So what you would do is just kind of roll the roll the edit to the next, to the other drive. A HyperDeck you know, has two drives that are there and then pull the other ones out and, and make them work. You look for transitions that you don't care about. Um, that's another way to kind of just manage it, stop, pull, start, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so there's a variety of ways you do it, but you're recording locally. You're not ex expecting... Once you go over 12 hours, and really, uh, for me, once I go over four hours on YouTube, I've had things go out on YouTube that says, I'm going to compress this. It's four hours long, and it never comes back. <laughs> like it, just, it, just, it just goes into the ether, and it never, never ends up anywhere. So, so as a result, anything that matters to you, you wanna, you're going to want to record locally. And that can be done. Um, Courtney has talked about less expensive H.264 recorders um, that you can record to. So those are those are. But if you're trying to record something you want to edit later, then you would use something like a HyperDeck. But but if you're just trying to keep it, um, an H.264 recorder would be fine. And many of those can record for many hours. Um, but you might have a couple of them that you overlap to make sure that you get you you have redundancy and backup and everything else to make that actually work. Um, as far as in the stream will stay up, I mean, there's some streams that have been running on YouTube for years. And so I wouldn't depend on YouTube. I wouldn't start and stop anything. I would just let the stream do what it's going to do. And then what I would do is is um, simply record locally and then repost those things. And usually no one's going to watch that whole stream again. So you also want might want to think about a highlights team that's just pulling together the things that were the most interesting and kind of sucking a lot of the 
uh, time out of it. Or if you want to leave it up as a record, put them up, put, put those things up as, as um, you know, sections, you know, part one, part two, part three, and make them a certain number of hours, three or four hours long each. Um, you know, that can, that can make it a little easier. But those are some of the things that I would, that I would consider as I, as I looked at that problem. Go ahead, Courtney. Don't the black magic recorders have automatic rollover if they have the multiple disk drive rack up? It'll automatically roll from drive one when it fills to drive yep. two to drive three and you just pull yep. out the old one and stick you it. Can, you can just simply point them out. And it'll keep circling forever, yeah. Right. Look, it, without, we don't, without any loss because it, it, mm -hmm. it, you know, it goes right up to the frame and then the new one starts at the next frame. And you, and you definitely can do that. In the past, what we've done is we've always started, stopped and started it where we want it to be cut. Like it's just that, so it's not some random in the middle of something um, because we have had lost a frame or two here and there for that kind of thing. So, um, so what we would, what we typically do is like a lot of times you have play out system. And if you don't, if you're doing a 48 hour or a 26 hour, the, the big thing with that for us has been, how do you fill the time? So how do you fill breaks? How do you fill transitions? How do you get a break for a minute that you don't have to edit? And so for us, those are some playouts, behind the scenes playouts. We already have those somewhere else. So we don't, that, that's, all of that's disposable content, the playouts, because they can be reinserted. Um, we also do time lapses of the setup. That's a really great way to just kind of throw things, so throw something at somebody is like, or a time lapse of the convention. Um, you know, we would leave, we can leave those up. People will, what we find is that we just don't lose a lot of viewers. Uh, if you put up a time lapse of the build, they'll all stay. <laughs> is know, that so why we do the top of the hour break to black here on office hours? Uh, we do the, no, we do the break to black because we're trying to automate. We're going to eventually automate severing, you know, cutting the two apart. And we're just figuring out how to do that. <laughs> so, so we're so there's a there's us getting the system working, and then as we go into next year, it'll automatically. The goal for us is eventually to be able to atomize the first hour and then keep the second hour as a whole unit and and do it all in an automated way, as opposed to um, having to have somebody go through there and cut all of those. So that's that's the reason it's there. Next question, Douglas Carmichael's back with Sam out. And the OpenAI brain drain, do you think we'll see ChatGPT go down the Twitter X path? In essence, degrading performance, little to no development, etc. Good, Courtney. Only if they sell it to somebody like Joe Rogan or something, you know, a millionaire or somebody with a lot of money that uh, <laughs> you know, wants to take it in a different direction. Uh, I think uh, they're probably going to be ripe for... Uh, uh, selling more of their stock to Microsoft to let Microsoft be the majority uh, shareholder uh, if they don't see a path forward with their current brain trust. Uh, whoever's left, you know, who hasn't left the company, uh, they may just, the shareholders that are left in OpenAI may just want to cash out and sell off to Microsoft. Yeah, it's, um, I, I think that the Twitter, the Twitter route is would be a rosy future for open AI. <laughs> like, you know, like about how this is going to go. Um, you know, they, they, you know, like that would be, a, that would be as, as good as it gets, you know, like, you know, so, um, uh, so I think that this is going to, this could devolve very quickly. If, if you are in open AI, this is your moment. Like your, your stock is as high as if, if you're invested in it, if you're a, an employee, anything else, this is as good as it's ever going to get. You should, you should get out while the get out's good. So, um, so I, I think they that, froze all of that. I thought the people inside open AI can't do anything. Yeah, well, they can leave. <laughs> like, you yeah, know, but, so, they, but in terms of their vested stock, I guess there is no yeah, there's, vested there's, stock. It's it's a weird yeah. stock structure, and it's and, very you know, odd. So the whole thing is, is like, the, there's, um, and again, it'll be what you'll never be able to do again as a company or a nonprofit is do what OpenAI did because it it exudes all the things that investors are worried about when it comes to weird. Uh, business models. They're always like, oh, we don't want to invest in weird business models because bad things will happen and bad things ha definitely have happened and now they will never do it again. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, so, but if you're, uh, again, I think that if you're a developer there or an investor there or whatever, everyone's going to be trying to find the way to the door, you know, like um, to, at this point. So it, it's not just that they let go of Sam Altman. It's that they did it so suddenly and so badly and with, with so little communication. It's not one thing. It's just that there were so many, there were so many things that happened there that just were reckless. That that they're gonna. The only thing I can think of is that whatever he came up with that was new that they didn't know about is actually something really significant, and they spiked the company because of it. Um, that's all I can think of is people who are risk adverse, you know, from research companies that aren't business people, getting scared and just 
putting a spike in the ground. Yeah, go ahead, Nigel. Emmett Sear has accepted the CEO role at OpenAI. So um, he's the guy from Twitch. So he's, they obviously he obviously thinks there's something to run. Or something to be that he's interested in. Like, I don't know if, uh, you know, I, I think that he, uh, uh, yeah, it's not like Twitch is taking off. <laughs> like, I mean, Twitch, they, they sold Twitch, but it's not like it's, I don't know if that's the, that's the, uh, the best example of I'm going to take this and make it great. Um, you know, Twitch is kind of plateaued in a lot of ways. So um, next question. Another QR code from Zach Jeffers in Spokane, Washington. Have 10 to 20 SRT HLS remotes for multiple simultaneous live streams. Different shows, some shots contribute to multiple shows. Should I invest in hardware or look forward to something like SRT mini server plus vMix in the cloud? Virtual video control room is the local workflow dying off? Yeah, the I mean, it depends on what on on what you're trying to stream. Um, so the reason that we would use local video or in servers and so on and so forth, which would be typically some kind of multi um, uh, multicast situation, um, would it, we've done that in the past of, of providing a lot of streams for something that are all only available in the local area. This is a lot of streams. I mean, I think that VVCR. This is a. Uh, 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 Corey Benke was on uh, a while ago from LiveX talking about it. And this could be an interesting possibility there. So I would definitely take a look at it. I, I, I can say that for us, what we would probably do, or what I would probably do, I would probably look pretty hard at a bunch of links, to be honest, like a bunch of elemental links, like little ones. Um, these are all 1080p, I assume. And I would just, you know, I'd have them stacked up, you know, pairs of them. Uh, pushing them into AWS and and doing the compression there, um, you know, and, and being able to manage it, record it, send it, you know, route it, so on and so forth. You could probably find, you might be able to find less expensive ways, but these are little thousand dollar boxes that are, um, that that let you just feed all the stuff into the system. So um, that'd be probably the way I would approach that many streams. I've definitely done that many streams with just elemental appliances, but that'd be a pretty expensive process. I mean, it would take you... Uh, well, if it's 10 to 20, if you say eight, uh, yeah, it would be much cheaper to get 40 of the, 40 of the, uh, of the, uh, links would cost you 40 grand. Um, the elemental 700, which I think has 16 in and outs, um, would, would be a hundred thousand at least. I mean, that's, I mean, it would at least a hundred thousand. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, maybe, maybe 150,000. So yeah, so probably cheaper to just get a bunch of links. You just need a lot of bandwidth too. I uh, go ahead, Chris. Um, it's interesting that you think it'd be cheaper to just buy all the hardware. Um, it, if you're I only using it for one the, show, what, what, if you're yeah. only using it for one show, then, then not. Um, and you know, the reality is there's probably enough hardware, there's probably enough power in an M2 to, to put a, a card in and do eight 1080p streams. Like I, I mean, I just, uh, I have to admit that I'm not a big uh, software only encoder person. Like I, I mm -hmm. get appliances for these things. Like, and they're they're still software defined. The elementals are software defined, but they are like a dedicated piece of hardware that only does one thing. Is the kind of thing that I when it when it matters is the kind of stuff that I want to have running. Go ahead, Chris. What yeah, are you I, I was gonna say I, it, it seems like I, I would definitely look into some of the the brain trust of this community because it may very well be. That if you that if you're only going to do this one time, you'd be better off just building. You know, and there's some really smart people. You could build a whole infrastructure in the cloud to 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 do all this possibly, and not have to be dedicated. To like oh, I got to buy a bunch of boxes and then build a bunch. Well, of Well, I'm assuming that you nightmare. If you're if you're if it's all defined from Zoom or it's all defined remotely in playouts, that makes sense. I'm assuming that some of these streams are have cameras connected to them. You know, like the, you know, they're, they're not just, but if they're, if they're, if they are, then that's a different, yeah. if it's all virtual, anyway. you're right that you could do it all in the cloud there's no reason to have a bunch of hardware there. But if you are, but if some of this is, uh, actually coming from the ground, you're going to need to have something to put it into the cloud, you know? So, but, but I do think, I do think that the VVCR could be one and, and Corey, you know, we're trading notes with Corey. I think he's ready to do a lab sometime soon. So stay tuned for in December, we'll get Corey to kind of. Uh, sit down with us and kind of walk through VVCR. It's really cool. Uh, next question. Paul Wallace back again from Hot Springs, Arkansas. What's the minimal live convention coverage setup for three people? Two people? One? Go ahead, Bill. 
Well, it's been interesting to me because I've been had the privilege of being able to sit and watch this team do live coverage from various things and watch it evolve over the course. I will say that, it, it, you know, you say persons, but is that persons or locations? What are you trying to do with a live coverage? If you're trying to cover a big event like we have with Cinegear and NAB and things like that, every time you add a secondary crew to your initial crew, I think the complexity... It's it's beyond logarithmic how much more complicated it gets to try to do it well. Uh, I've watched Alex on, you know, really working hard to try to bring the best, most stable show. And it is not trivial. Uh, people think you can just go out with some sort of a, you know, an iPhone or something like that and do consistent, reliable coverage. And so far, I haven't seen that. I've watched really smart people on the back end and on the front end work really hard to get a stable you know, almost like watching television coverage out of a location. And I, I, again, I'm just going to say it's it's not trivial. You can sometimes get it to work, but consistency and dependability are hobgoblins in this area right now. It is possible, and it's interesting, next week I'm going to L.A. and I'm going to be involved in another kind of live from a thing. And I've been talking to them about what their back-end infrastructure is. Can and they're us? trying to do it. Can you tell us what you're doing? Where are you going? Um, Where are you going? And not well. It has to do with the thing I used to go over for, for L.A. They're they're talking about doing. Yeah, why not? I mean, it's it's kind of public. Uh, one of my friends, Sven, Sven Pape, is has a pretty large YouTube channel about editing, and he's known for a long time all the people back at uh, at. Michael Horton's old L.A. FCPUG. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of come out live for one of the sessions that is going to get a lot of interest on. And I was talking to them, so are you bringing in a live view or something? They said, no, we've tested the lines and we think they're okay. We think and they're as okay. Soon as I, Famous last yeah, words. As soon as I hear that, I, you just go, okay. So I don't have anything writing on it. I know these people. I've tried to hook them up. I know what, they're working with good people. Thursday, uh, Wednesday, a week okay. from this coming Wednesday. Was it in the and I actually thought of calling you and saying, you know, is your live you doing anything? Because these are friends. And, well, is it, you know, is it in the is it is it in the in the morning or the evening? Evening you know. gallery theater. It'll be their regular Los Angeles final. Not final. Well, Los Angeles. I actually program. may be in L.A. that day. So, so oh, will let you? Me, let me know. I may. Hey, listen, I might be, do me so. a favor. Bring your live you, and just in mm. case, I'll hook you up <laughs> with everybody. And if it's yeah, sitting in a corner and everything goes south, I would love that. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a little complicated because the other side of it is in, in a box. So um, that's exactly what I'm saying. It's way yeah. more complicated than you think, and yeah. to have something reliable, you need the brain trust and the hardware and the. Where are they doing it strategy. from? Are they doing it from? The, the... It's the Gallery Theater. It's a pretty, pretty little place on top of a hill in central Los Angeles. Is it the same place that F, uh, the that Michael Horton's? Yes. Is it the same yes. uh, that theater? What was it? it yes. Was called. Not the gallery. It's the theaters. gallery. Yeah, it's it's, it's in, the, in Barnsdale Park. Barnsdale Park. Gallery yeah, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I'm going to go over to see friends. And uh, well, let's I, talk about it. Let's see. Let's see yeah. if I'm going to actually be down there. Yeah, that'd be good. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah I'd love to. That'd be fun. Uh, I could even bring even links or something else. The links will. The the thing is, is that the elemental links. The reason I use them a lot is because they handle bandwidth fluctuations much better than just turning on an encoder. They won't drop as many frames or. Any sometimes. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, if you're in, let me know, and I'll tell yeah. Sven, and we'll we'll talk. I got cameras. They, they test the bandwidth, uh, you know, when nobody's there, and then you know when the show starts, and there's you know 150 yeah. people with phones on, and so many downloading things. stuff, and so their laptops things. open. Uh, yeah, yeah. And suddenly your bandwidth goes away. As far as the question goes, you know, the minimal, you know, remember Justin TV, the guy who live streamed his entire life 24-7. Uh, so you could do it with one phone. Uh, it depends on your audience. If your audience has a tolerance for boredom, uh, <clears throat> you could put, uh, you know, a, a single phone as long as there's a good uh, Wi-Fi connection or better yet, cellular connection in the uh, convention center. Uh, you could put uh, a phone up on a gimbal and just carry it around and there's software that lets you split the two cameras to put, you know, your interviewee on the front, you know, on the back of the camera and the front facing camera you can have on yourself and uh, do a picture in picture. That's the simplest form which you could get away with, the minimal, minimal. Anything above that uh, with two crews or two persons, you're going to need somebody on the back end to manage the stream and to switch between the two and to jump to if uh, neither one of the remote crews are ready to go because in a convention, you know, you 
don't want to barge in and interrupt people or you, it's difficult to schedule things so that you can ping pong evenly from one crew to the next crew to the next crew without having to buffer something in the middle between the two to you know maintain the interest in the stream while the other crew is not ready to present yet. So it, it jumps from just a one, one-man one band interview guy, and you see those guys at conventions all the time that are streaming on their own private channels that just have their iPhone. They have a monopod on a, with a gimbal and a monopod, and they're walking around with some headphones on, and, they're, and a hand mic that they're interviewing people with. Uh, that kind of a setup would be your minimal setup, but it's not going to entertain a very large audience. So it depends on your target audience and how much tolerance they have for tedium. Yeah, the, the, um, I mean, you can, you know, so what I've done in the past is if I'm, if it's one person, I tend to do POV. I don't try to shoot myself at all. So I'm in a stream, and I'm just going to show you what I'm seeing and walking through things. And, and again, <clears throat> having a, the big thing with all three of these setups on a one, two, or three is to have a monopod that you can set down. Otherwise, you'd be surprised at how quickly that camera, even if it's a phone, gets heavy um, if you're holding it out for a long period of time. And so having a monopod that you can kind of sit there, it'll stabilize it a lot. Um, if it's one person, that's really what you're doing. You may be handing someone a mic and you let people just kind of live through the the roughness of your handing somebody something. You can, I mean, a lot of these mics have gotten pretty good. You can't just point it at people, but if, as the convention gets busier and you get around certain booths, you'll not be able to hear the person talk very well. It just depends on how how loud the convention center is. With two people, now you're having a person, what we've done in the past for that is two, is a person with a live view backpack. They've got a camera going into it. Everything's feeding into it. We've done that a fair, I mean, for some of these. And I've got a wireless, um, you know, mic and you can walk around and talk to people and so on and so forth. So two is a very viable number. Three, the, ne- the third person is usually a producer. So what we do is we have somebody kind of paying attention to what we're doing next, running over and telling people we're coming, you know, doing those kinds of things. And then you can keep on adding from there. But those are kind of the, the steps of what, what I would do um, uh, with those numbers. Uh, next question. With the QR code hat trick, it's Zach Jeffers from Spokane, Washington. Completed three 22 to 26 hour simultaneous live feeds. After all the prep and production, we woke up to YouTube deleting the stream videos. Though the stream page, thumbnail, comments, studio entry still there, just says this live stream recording is not available help yeah yeah you need to record locally if you're going to do i mean if anything that matters to you you need to record locally you cannot expect your live streaming you should never expect your live streaming uh delivery location to be the only record that you have of the of your show um and that means you should you, you'll need to have some recorders that are recording at some point you have to invest in those as, as you do those streams but you should never be dependent on that. No, you may still have those. Maybe you're just trying to hang on to those. I wouldn't worry about the chat. I mean, people talk about the chat all the time, trying to protect the chat and trying to save the chat. If, if we cut it, we'll lose the chat. If we repost, we'll lose the chat. Just let it go. You know, like it's just, you know, the chat. No one, I, I know people talk about people watching it. I don't think anybody really does. I'm sorry. I just don't think people really care when you're watching later about seeing the chat. Um, because you lose it if you want you to do the edit or reposting. Um, but, but I don't think, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend as much time on it as I think a lot of people seem to. Um, but what I would do is simply, I would do highlight reels. I don't think I'd post 22 to 26 hours either. Um, you know, I don't know what the content of this is, but, you know, I think that finding ways to atomize it and get highlight reels and so on and so forth is going to be a much more doable thing. There's something about being there, which was great for the 22 to 26 hours that you did, but I don't think that people want to relive that again. Now, that's not been our experience when we watch, you know, user behavior is that they want to watch a 22 hour thing again that isn't live. You know, like they, they might want to watch it live. It does, there's something about live streams that go long that we have found. So we've done some, I guess we've done, you know, anywhere from 24 to 72 hour live streams. And there's something about a culture that builds up in the viewership that people are there and it's kind of something happening and they're seeing their friends. We did some gaming ones that were like that over the weekend. We'd start on Friday night and sometime on Sunday. And, and there was something about it that there's a camaraderie that happens um, that, that, that is special. Like I will say that these long streams, if there's some, I mean, they're grueling. As the production crew, they are just brutal, you know, because you have to, you know, and we never had enough people where I could just, it was like this easy to hand off thing. There was just some of us that were barely sleeping to make these all work just to tie it together. Because most of these long streams, didn't have a big budget, you know, and so we were, there was this kind of like this kind of uh, 
dreamlike state that you end up in when you finish these and you have that smell in your nose when you haven't slept all down like and and you just kind of like this this kind of like you know but but there was something about it you know i remember there was uh when we finished the holiday hole you know there was we ran we didn't know that youtube could run into a, a thousand comment per minute limit and we saw it like and all it was i mean it was just like this huge explosion at the very end of the show um, and all it was, was people saying this was great and great to see everybody. Bye. You know, like all that stuff. But there was like this, there was some kind of thing that had happened there that I thought that was really profound. And we saw that, we see that with every long stream, that there's the people who hang out with it and be part of it. And, it, and it's not usually, they're not super well, you know, overproduced. They're not overproduced. Um, they're just kind of, uh, low key and, and it's, it's interesting, but I don't think people want to watch it again. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Alex, I've been listening to you talk about that backhoe video for three and a half years. The first time I've heard it called the holiday hole. Um, what I was going to say is if, if you think about just the, just the logistics of the length of a program, okay? And, and if you put something up for a couple of minutes, let's say, somebody will stumble across it. You might really well publicize it and everybody's sitting there with bated breath waiting for it to start. But if something is really long, what you get is you get the possibility of like the second wave where I'm sitting at home, wa <clears throat> excuse me, watching this guy digging a hole with a backhoe. And all of a sudden I'm like getting on the, you know, instant messenger, Preto, you got to check this out. Go follow this link. Go, go watch this thing. And you can get like a second wave of people. I, I, it just makes sense. And I think that at a certain duration, you get the possibility of a second wave. If, if I don't know how long it's going to go, I may not reach out to anybody because by the time they get there, it's going to be over. And I'll also say about the, the long haul shows, I did a, a gaming stream for somebody years ago. I, I can't even remember what the game was. And I had the first shift and the third shift. And in between, I went to a hotel and slept. And it was like a summer night. It was in San Francisco. And I was so fried. Even after going to the hotel to rest, I got back to the to the site. I got out of my car and I went in. I left my windows down in my car. Like that's how that's how just blitzed oh, yeah. fried I was. It was a bad yeah. bad morning when I finally got back, got, got back to my car. <laughs> this is this is by the way, someone put it up on YouTube. This is the uh this is the last 30 seconds of of the holiday hall. You can see us moving our our earth movers there and you can see like this is what the the chat looked like um you see all the nose boom, you know like so but everyone was having i mean that was a and there was something about it um you know there's sixteen thousand people watching you know us us dig a hole um and uh it was funny <laughs> the best part was my favorite part of the whole holiday hole um with cards against humanity it was they do this kind of like they hate black friday I mean, what's funny is, is that the founders of Cards Against Humanity are just some of the the nicest people. <laughs> they just really care. Like they um, they wanted to take a uh, they wanted to give the people in China that made their cards uh, a day a week off for for vacation, and they knew that they would do something. Um, uh, they knew that they would just work through the vacation. They would take the money, and then they would just work again somewhere else. And so they literally. Uh, they gave them, or they, the factory would have them do something else. And so they literally sent someone over and they paid everyone for that week to be gone. And they paid the company to keep it open so that there was nothing else that could be done. And they had somebody on site to make sure that nothing else happened in the building. And like people were just went home for a week, you know, so that's the kind of guys that they are just really trying to make sure that people get, get taken care of. And they don't like, they don't, they're not a big fan of the, the craziness around Black Friday. And so they do something every week. I mean, sometimes they had nothing. And in this case, they dug a hole for no reason. And someone said, why aren't you spending this money? The best part was like people were, you had to give money to keep them. They would stop digging if you stopped giving them money. Um, and, uh, and people said, why aren't you giving this money to charity? And they, and they said, why aren't you giving this money to charity? Charity, <laughs> which I thought that was the best FAQ. <laughs> anyway, a um, uh, lot of lot of fun there. Uh, anyway, so it was, if you search "holiday hole," you'll see us our 
artwork um, done. Uh, it was there's so many great stories about that about that show. Um, and a uh, quick reminder, of course, that uh, we are going to be doing Q and A throughout the week. Um, so if you are interested in, um, uh, in in asking your questions, this is going to be the great week to ask all the questions. I'm sure we're going to have a great, a lot of us are slowing down a little bit. So you're going to have a, a great panel every day. So go ahead and throw those questions in. Uh, we are doing our first meeting uh, uh, tonight. If you're interested in, in the Eclipse coverage that's going to happen in April, our first meeting's tonight. So go ahead and sign up for that. You'll see a link to do that um, in uh, Discord and in, in the email. I think one of the emails that went out uh, has an opening for, uh, th- for throwing your name in there. But we're going to start meeting and start just thinking about what we want to do. We don't have a full plan yet, but we're working on it. Um, And uh, now we're going to go ahead and jump into the second hour. I don't think they thought I was going to remember. I think that they thought I was going to (laughs) forget to go to the second hour. (laughs) Let's jump into the next question. Another QR code question, this time from Andre Dole in Berlin. Anyone else experiencing that Discord on Mac quits very often when closing the lid? I very often have to launch Discord again. I think this was different in earlier versions using an M1 MacBook Pro on Ventura. All right, go ahead, Alex. I feel your pain, Andre. It's uh, it's terrible when apps don't work reliably. Um, I My recommendation to you would be to not use Electron apps. I find that they're generally unreliable and memory hogs. Uh, I actually, I love Discord. The way I use it is I use it through a web browser I'm not entirely clear what that Electron app gives you over the web interface. I haven't noticed any difference, but the web interface for me in a browser has always been reliable for me. Go ahead, CJ. I don't run into crashing so much as every now and again when I launch, it takes a really long time to open. Like it checks for updates for what seems like 10 minutes. And I'm not uh, I'm not sure if that's related or if it's just the uh, Apple Silicon thing, but wanted to throw my hat in the Discord weirdness. Go ahead, Chris. I think I think there's a lot of apps that are written by primarily Windows people, and they they suffer. That you can just tell they suffer. I had a lot of trouble with the Discord app. I gave up using it I think, about a year and a half or two ago. And what I didn't realize, what I didn't realize, that when you go to Discord.com in your browser, there's just a little button up there. And it took me a long time to realize, oh, just click the thing. It says open Discord. And it remembers your password and everything. And so it actually works quite well in the browser. But uh, I struggled. I tried to use the app for a long time. And it was a nightmare. Sorry, sometimes I get lost in my windows. Go ahead, Bill. Um, I had those problems for quite a while on Discord. I'd launch it every morning for the show to keep track of the Discord, and it used to be exactly what CJ said. It would sit there and spin and spin and spin and spin and spin and never launch. Uh, eventually, I don't. I, maybe when I updated to my new Mac, this is an M2 uh, Max. Um, this laptop has no problems in any respect with running Discord. I do it every day. I click it. It takes maybe six, five seconds to open. Uh, it's solid. It never presents any problems. So I think it's one of those things where they've been writing and rewriting and rewriting. And if your machine isn't kind of where their code base is, it may take a lot of extra steps to get things done. It seemed like upgrading my machine made all of those go away. So that's just anecdotal for me. Yeah, my Discord runs for months. Like I don't, I mean, it, it, every once in a while I, I restart the machine and it comes up and it has to do its little updates and everything else. But I just very rarely have any instability. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, his question was about when closing the lid and, you know, in the Mac, you close the lid on Mac, it suspends all work and basically does a deep sleep uh, and, you know, just barely keeps things alive. Maybe memory keeps alive and I don't even know if they do that, keeps alive in the, uh, or if they shuffle it off to the uh, hard drive. Uh, keeps it alive until you open the lid again and it restarts. And maybe the difference between the last time Discord pinged to check in, to check for messages, and the current time it checks in, if there's a too big a mismatch between those two times, maybe it triggers a reboot and that's where it's getting hung. A restart and that's where it's getting hung. That's just a guess. Good and also, as as far as the why the Mac version you know crashes a lot, and maybe the Windows version doesn't, is when you write software that's cross-platform and you define decide to find a language that can export across platform, 
especially if you've got a unique user interface, uh, it can be very difficult to, to find a user interface that works across both platforms without and bug free. So that's usually what the problem is. Good, Bill. Well, closing the lid is interesting because you can run these laptops in headless mode. So uh, I found the OS in laptop use to be very intelligent. It knows what else is connected to the machine at all the time. So if I have external monitors and an external keyboard and I close the lid, it just goes into headless mode and it doesn't do anything ever. And people run all day long like that. But it's been really interesting to me if I don't have anything into my plugged into my computer, it gives me a vastly limited number of OS choices. When it starts to see things connected to it, it suddenly expands those choices and gives me new menus and new possibilities, particularly in multi-screen environments, because a lot of things I use every day for office hours that require three or four or five screens to be active, if I take out those connections, all that interface goes away because it knows I'm not going to use it. So that's just the way it's programmed these days. Next question. Next question from Alexander Knight in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia, Canada. I have the LG quad monitor on a motorized stand. I've created a problem for myself as the camera blocks the screen. Thought about putting the camera on a motorized slider so I can move it out of the way when not in use. Other suggestions? Welcome. Go ahead, Courtney. Get four screens and <laughs> put it in the middle of them uh, at the apex of the corners. Uh, that's why we have these smaller screens rather than one big one that's uh, with a multi-view on it because you can put the camera in the middle uh, without covering up the screens. Um, otherwise, you know, you'd have to get a pretty big-sized prompter glass to put your camera behind that and have it on a whole motorized table that goes up and down. Uh, you could do it that way. But the problem is when you've got such a big screen uh, that's divided into quadrants, uh, it's going to be tough to put your camera behind one of them or in the middle of them. The uh, some more breaking news in the drama that is open to AI. Um, we <laughs> so this this news just keeps on getting crazier. Uh, Mira uh, Mira uh, Mirati, um wrote a letter that is now just bouncing all over the internet. Um, the letter says, uh, to the board and of directors, uh, to the, to the board of directors at OpenAI. OpenAI is the world's leading AI company. We, the employees of OpenAI have developed the best models and pushed the field to new frontiers. Our work on AI safety and governance shapes global norms. The, the products uh, we built are used by millions of people around the world until now the company we work for and cherish has never been in a stronger position. Uh, the process through which you terminated Sam Altman and removed Greg Brockman from the board has jeopardized all of this work and undermined our mission and company. Your conduct has made it clear you did not have the co the, um, the competence to oversee a open AI. Uh, we will all, uh, w when we all unexpectedly learned of your decision, the leadership team at OpenAI acted swiftly to stabilize the company. We carefully listened to your concerns and tried to co cooperate with your, you on all grounds, despite many requests for specific facts for your allegations. You have never provided any written evidence. Um, they also increased, uh, uh, real, they also uh, increasingly realized you are not, or you were not capable of carrying out your duties and were negotiating in bad faith. Uh, the leadership team suggested um, that the most stabilizing path forward, the one that would best serve our mission, company, stakeholders, employees, and the public, would be for you to resign and put in place a qualified board um, that could lead the company forward in stability. Leadership worked um, with you around the clock to find a mutually agreeable outcome, yet within two days of your initial decision, you again replaced interim CEO Mira uh, Mirati against the, um, against the best interest of the company. Uh, you also informed the leadership team uh, that allowing the company to be destroyed would be, quote unquote, uh, would destroyed, quote unquote, would be consistent with the mission. This is what I was talking about earlier. Um, uh, your actions have made it obvious that you're incapable of, of overseeing open AI. We are unable to work uh, for or with people with lack of competence, um, judgment, uh, and care for our mission and employees. We, the undersigned, may choose to resign from open AI um, uh, to join the newly announced Microsoft subsidiary run by Sam Altman and Greg Brockman. Uh, Microsoft has assured us that there are positions for all open AI employees at this Ooh. new subsidiary. 
um, should we choose to join. Uh, we will take this step imminently unless all current board members resign and the board appoints two new lead uh, in independent directors such as Brett Taylor and Will Hurd and reinstates um, uh, Sam Altman and Greg Brockman. And this is signed by Mira Marathi, uh, Brad Lightcap, Jason Kwan, um, uh, what, what check, uh, Zar- Zaremba, I don't, I don't think I can say that one, uh, Alec Radford, uh, Anna uh, Makinju, Mac- um, uh, Bob McGrew, uh, Siri, uh, Siri Voss Nar- um Che Chang, Lillian Wen- uh, Wang, Mark Chen, and Ilya Sutzkiever. So Ilya, the one that, that we feel like is the beginning of this, Ilya also tweeted um, that he said, I deeply regret my participation in the board's actions. I never intended to harm open AI. I love everything we built together and we'll do everything I can to reunite the company. So, wow. Not anyway, one movie I coming, thought that was re- six that was, movies coming. I kind of wonder just, what the so contract epic. that uh, Sam Altman <laughs> signed epic. with Microsoft has, if it has any kind of... Wait, you know, cool off period or any way to get out of that. He's not, he's not coming back. They can get out of that. No, he's not. If they had to, you know. I don't think, I don't think he's coming back. Like, I think that, I think that it's, um, I mean, maybe if, if they really reaffirm, but the amount of work that it's going to take to, to dig out of this. And this is why, this is why we make decisions slowly <laughs> and talk Ready, about fire, them and aim. think about it. It's, yeah, this was, I mean, the worst it, this way is, to make decisions. They're going to, there's going to be entire courses at UC Berkeley and MIT and Harvard, Harvard over this. Everywhere this I mean, this is, this is now become like, wow, what an exercise. Uh, go ahead, John. So, so prior to this all happening, they were just getting ready to do another round based upon the equity in one of the the divisions one of the divisions that was was uh, was corporate and not nonprofit now that all goes out the window they're going to have a cash crunch here open ai is going to have a huge cash crunch yeah. over the ne- over the next uh, 6 months yeah well that's why i think i tweeted out i was like they're done in th- 36 months i was like i would say 12 months but everything always happens slower than i expected to so um so the uh but but i think that they they could be gone in 6 months i think you're right i mean they could literally just literally do- dissolve um you know very quickly now the the good news for all the the researchers that are all working there is that there aren't enough researchers in the industry so you know that you know you'll they'll all be absorbed I think the other co- other folks in the company, I mean, I think that anyone connected to this will probably be able to get a job somewhere in this business because it's really, it's arcing. But um, but I think that, wow, just a, it's just an amazing thing. I, I know that we just interrupted the show to talk about it, but you don't get to see this no, kind of- in real time? Whoa. It's like seeing, a is... media, it's like seeing a, <laughs> an asteroid hit a planet. You know, like it's just, it's just this crazy, like, okay, we can keep on talking about what we're talking about. And you look up and you're like, what is going on up there? So, now, isn't this an analog for what's happening? Because it's like the speed of communication of people saying these things have so outstripped the ability of markets well, to absorb it. What's going just, on? This is why everything is now too fast. You need to put people in a board that are equipped to manage a board. You don't put people from think tanks and boards. You put them on advisory boards, not board of directors. I'm sorry, but I'm just. I know that's a that's a generalization, but really they belong in. Board of, you don't you don't fill a board that way. You you have them as you want to talk to them. You want their input, but they aren't used to making decisions that are that are uh, impactful. <laughs> like you know that 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 are this impactful. You know if you make a a, a, a a a crazy decision in an academic institution, there's a lot of upset. People talk about things, but you know everyone goes back to school the next day. That's not what happens in companies, and um, and I think that they just weren't equipped to to deal with the pressure that they were under. Um, and so I do think that they're going to all have to resign i i don't know how they i don't know how they recover i don't i can't i don't see a path of recovery i think their their last path of recovery was sunday when they had a choice to step down and let sam altman and and brockman and greg brockman come back in they they step past that and i think that there's not i think you're going to see almost all the leadership you know go to microsoft and everyone's going to follow them i mean when microsoft says we'll hire everybody this is the cheapest way to to buy, as as John said earlier, this is the most inexpensive way to buy open AI is just to take everybody with, you know, just take everybody and hire them. Um, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, the funny thing would be to sell the remainder 51% to Apple. <laughs> you know, they've got to <laughs> buy it. I just think Apple doesn't like <laughs> drama. That you know, a, that's a, what a power the drama. that would be. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I thought about it. I, I was When I was getting ready for Twit, I was like, you know, this is the easiest way for Apple to solve uh 
uh, any of the AI deficiencies they feel like they have. The only issue is, is that I think Apple is too adverse to drama. Like they just don't want it. They don't want to be part of the drama that's that's here. They don't want to, and I don't think that they are as aggressive. I think they're they're probably closer to the board than they are to the to the folks that want to build AI into all these things. I think they're 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 more of a careful. Uh, they're group. the and ultimate I, ready aim fire company. They don't do anything. Well, they're they ready aim aim and then aim on your aim and then practice your aim exactly. and then and then and then we'll test the Point aim well for taken. a couple of years and then we'll and then we'll make sure that we've we've tied it in and then we will shoot but we'll shoot very carefully and then we'll like I mean that's that's the so um uh so I I think that uh I don't think that Apple I I did think that Apple was like well they could just pick him up and then they could build an entire AI system around him but Microsoft is more built for what he wants. Uh, or where, where he wants to go, I think. They'll be much more aggressive. And they'll, again, I think they'll take every person worth taking out of OpenAI within months. You know, like, and 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 then, and and, and it's, because it's it's a moment for Microsoft. I think we, we may look back at this as the biggest thing that happened, you know, Microsoft in a decade. Moment for the planet. Yeah, I mean, but it's, but I think that it's, um, because they, you know, they obviously were aggressive about working with OpenAI, to make sure that they were part of this, but now they have the the ability to be the center of it, you know, you know, and and I think that that's a pretty big opportunity for them. So a lot has changed in three days. Like that's the, the only reason we're paying attention to it is because it'll affect a lot of people, and a lot of it has all happened in that fast. Let me um, call my broker. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Time to sell yeah. that Microsoft. I don't. I wouldn't sell at Microsoft. I'd be buying. Well, it's going know. up. Yeah, and I don't no, have any I mean, Microsoft sell at stock. The top. I don't do stock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they're they're on their way up. Um, uh, next question. Zach Jeffers from Spokane, Washington, comes to us again from the QR code. You've mentioned the Chimera Duo in-ear headset on the show. Just an FYI, there's an earbudless version for those with KZ Audio or other two-pin IEMs already. Um, oh, interesting. Oh, and then these don't have the earplugs in them. So you can take your insoles and just pop them in. And then at the end there, it looks like there's a little jack to go that has a splitter to go from a, a an right. in and an out, a TRRS. So you can use it as a talk. Yeah, yeah. No, I have. So if you guys want to hear it, hold on. Where did I put it? Oh. Oh, here it is. So I'm using a slightly different adapter for it. Hold on. Wait, this might take a second. Um, I'm using a slightly different adapter for it um, because... I don't know where I, I don't even know where I put that that little splitter. I, I just don't like the analog splitter, so I put it into. I have an Audio Technica, uh, or no, I'm sorry, the Rode. Uh, Rode makes this AI Micro um, that's that's here, um, and so I so I, I put it into that, and then and I've already used it with my phone. I have not used it with the computer, so we're going to see how this goes. Does that go into? Does it have a USB interface in it, or is it just an analog combiner? It has. Well, so. Road, the AI micro takes. Uh, oh, did, you just, did I just change? Did you I just change you took phone? over your headset. Yeah. Yeah. When you plug in, it switched hold on, over. Hold on a second. Let me fix that then. One moment, please. We're Spelunking in again in the yeah. cave. Alex appears to be getting ready. Okay. Putting the headset in. And There's a lot of, can, I will say that you hear a back. lot of mic handling with it. You have to be super careful with the. Uh, using it we weren't uh, hearing very much at all right then that was amazing are you hearing oh you weren't i can hear it um oh it turned off interesting it, it, it automatically turned, turned it turns off musicians off yeah sound for yeah. musicians off okay, turn it back on. okay so this is what it sounds like i don't know how that sounds for everybody um but it's a, a headset bit thin and it's probably yeah i mean you would expect it to be thinner than the mic i was just using if it didn't then we shouldn't be using yeah, the mic we're just using it. wrong about it's physics. a little bit lower in level too uh, yeah yeah so i can uh let's see if i have what kind of controls do i have here um uh yeah so it's it's all the way up yeah so it's probably a little bit and i can probably move that a little bit you hear it now do you hear the move the mic yeah we're hearing noise. handling noise and the rest of it it's coming through uh, yeah so um so if i bring this up a little bit it's pretty directional it, it it's hard to get it exactly i just got it a little there we go um that might sound a little bit louder uh so so that's a you know still sounds a little bit low it's not not quite as loud as it needed to be if i, I i'm sure that if i let's see if i pull this up a little bit 
that might be a little bit better as far as getting as loud as we need it to be. And so it's not, so what we, uh, we tested it over the weekend and we felt that it was the best mic that we've heard on an iPhone, like the best external mic that we've just like a headset mic that we've connected to an iPhone. So if I was tempted to, um, you know, I'm probably going to carry it in my kit as like, this is a backup that I can jump on calls. It's, we definitely tested it against the, the, uh, open comms and decided that this was a better boom than the open comms, um, there. So if I wanted to be on a show and I was mobile and I just wanted to use my phone, this is not a bad, not a bad solution, um, to do that. Um, but I, but I think that, uh, you know, compared to other mics, it's probably not, not the fix, um, you know, in that area. And again, to, to what was shown here is I don't, I may have to run it through something to amplify it a little bit more because it's not, uh, it doesn't seem on its own. Even with the USB interface, it doesn't seem to be quite, quite as loud as everything else. Um, and you know, it's interesting to me. It, it, it's very clear, but I, the mic that always shocked me when I first put it on was the Countryman B3 because it's the first headset mic that had so much low end that was kind of honest yeah. that I thought, oh, I could actually use this for a remote thing and yeah. it would work. I don't hear that in this case, but again, I'm no, also but this is also IFB. a Countryman's a little bit more expensive too. You know? Oh, yeah, so it's, definitely. But what's really cool about it is, is that it is, it's all part of one piece. So this is a Makes dual sense. headset. That I can run behind me. I just didn't do it on this one, and they, these swing around. So it's a it's an interesting. Anyway, this is this is the mic. I, at first, I was going to send it back because I was like, oh, it's a lot of handling noise and everything else. But I do think that it's a solid one. If I want to be on a show or if I wanted to jump into something and I wanted to be clearer than most other headsets, um, it's it's actually not a bad solution. Uh, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, it actually sounds a lot better than I thought it would uh, yeah. at that price point. How, how is the sound quality, though, on the earpiece in comparison it's good. to you? It's good. Yeah? It's in-ear. Yeah, I mean, it's probably, uh, it's very clear. It's very, um, I don't think it's quite as good as the the linsoles that I have. I mean, it's not quite as loud. Um, but it also, it is giving me zero latency back to me. I'm not sure, actually, if that's happening with the AI Micro. or. And what's interesting is AI Micro has another mic. So I have this idea this AI Micro has a second mic in. I think, and I have to test this, if I put a Y in the headphone output of this, that I could have two people on it and have like them both hearing the show and themselves, but hearing both mics at the same time. Super so mobile could, kit. So you could have like this crazy small mobile kit. Um, we just did one with two people for Michael Krasny's show for Grey Matter, and um, it was... Uh, it was you know this this would have we still would have done what we did we did countrymen with uh with a mix pre that's a better solution but we thought about wouldn't it be nice to have something that was a little smaller and this is again the only thing i can worry about is this you know you really hear it i hear it a lot so you'd have to be very careful about how you use it you you couldn't really i don't think you can send this to a civilian like you have to send it to someone who knows what to do with the mic to make that actually work. And they probably can't. That might be beard. a problem with a bearded subject too. Yeah. If say, it's that sensitive can't. to handling noise. Yeah. Probably. And it's interesting that zoom, when you turned a musician, original sound off, uh, it really filtered out a lot of that handling noise. It was amazing that the zoom does. A, the zoom filtering is kind of amazing. Like it's, it really does a lot of good things. It, it caps things off a little bit, but it does like we had a problem on Friday where, we we filtered it out eventually, but it was like we didn't hear anything wrong, and we switched it to original audio, and partially into the show, we could hear this little clicking, and Zoom had taken that all out. Like, it was like a, you know, it had just removed it in real time, so, um, yeah. Alex, is the boom robust enough that you can bend it and shape yeah. it around your cheek? Yeah, I mean, I'm, it's pretty close to my cheek right now. I mean, yeah, it's, that's good. you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, so I can, I can definitely get it to where it needs to be, yeah. Can can you easily without screwing up your system and coming back to where you need to be? Can can you easily gain up a little bit? No, I don't have any other gain. I mean, I can I could probably here I could probably do a. Uh, so you're going USB into your computer now? Uh, this is USB into the computer. Yeah, this is mm -hmm. going through this okay. AI micro. That's here because okay. this is the the headset itself is analog, and it has. And I will say I, I did test it. Hold on, is it still? Let's see, this will convert back there. Or is it still? Yeah, no. There is a analog, a TRRS that comes with it that you can combine these. And I found the gain, the gain was, um, I think, worse. Oh, here it is. Hold on. I'll switch it for you. So hold on. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to unplug the USB in interface, and I'm going to plug in 
what came with it, and then we'll make this an right. input and see what happens. While, so, while you're doing you, that, oh wait, you're going to you zoom us, mute while you do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not the. Yeah, yeah, hold on, I'll zoom. Go ahead, Chris. What I was going to say is, I don't know that the benefit of original sound uh, outweighs the how well that thing smashed out all of the handling. You know, Courtney, you mentioned, it's like, oh, we don't hear yeah. it because the original sound was off. Right. I it mean, it did good, sound right? better, but... If you don't it, have the low end to protect or you're not trying to protect the really high quality microphone, then I think Chris is right on. Also, it yeah, looks for high, it was, you know, it looks for high volume transients and it just filters those out and without touching the frequency of the low frequency or the high frequency, so... Yeah, the, the only thing that's against is Alex's idea of we really want to make this the most listenable show possible because he believes, and I think I agree with him, that fatigue over the course of time listening to processed audio is always going to be more problematic than sending as good a sound as you possibly can for, okay. for long-term listening. There you go. Now, can you hear me now? Yes. Much louder. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's much louder. Okay. And does it yeah, sound any better? Or? compressed, like it's a telephone worse. call. Yeah. sounds like you're driving the compressor a little too hard. Back it down on. if you have any control over that. Yeah, so um, it's coming loud. This is using... Now, the, the, the other side of this is that I can't hear myself anymore. So and You're at negative 13, 14 on the meter, so be careful. Okay, hold on. Don't uh, shout. Yeah, we are glad that Ofan is so pleasant with us. His present annual pains we thank you for. We matched our rackets to these balls. We will, in France, by God's grace, play a set. Much better. Day. So that's so that CB is the radio is gone. The CB radio is gone because it's not being mashed up against it's not the being compressed by the no. And my hold on, my and here's here's it with uh, audio. This is with musician sound for musicians on. So now it's a little, probably a little little lower there. I can probably bring it up a little bit. Um, so now so th there I am. So this is with the this is this is not clearly, the road. this is clearly worse. Uh, right with the musician sound on. There's a lot of air and hiss yeah. going on what we were saying as you were swapping your headset out is that um i'm gonna take this out too so i'm gonna go back to what i was doing just give me one second i'll uh, just give me one second hold okay. on one second hold, hold that back thought. and then we'll then we'll talk to yeah, you yeah. it'll only take me uh, while you unplug, take we're just going to talk about you fine be that way <laughs> uh hold on a second here fredo's got a spinning beach fredo's ball fredo's got his beach ball <laughs> Ooh, 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 the mute, the mute, the mute. Uh, this is the first day on comms for somebody. That's what it sounds audio like. Ever. And now he mutes. You got to build a little spinner for that. I told him. Mount, mount it to the hand fans. And mount it. Mount, <laughs> mount it to a hand fan or a or an okay, impact and then driver. Back. So this hey. is this is back to the next pre three. So this is what we were saying, Alex, and by, and by we, I mean me. Um, the benefits of original sound were there, but not spectacular. However, turning original sound off absolutely got rid of all the handling noise. Like even when you were yeah. touching it saying, oh, look, I mean, there's a lot of handling noise, we got nothing. So I would say that with the original sound off, so, it's actually pretty good. Yeah, I, I, I actually, I mean, we go back and forth when we're recording the podcast about whether we want, I, I always feel like I want to get the most raw version of it f for post-processing. So I still lean, we're still doing it that way. But there are times when I think maybe we should just turn on original, off original sound and just, you know, from a, from a process, um, you know, perspective uh, that we might want to do it there. So now admittedly, the one that really worked, the road um, with that, you know, that's another, I don't know how much money on top of it. So you're probably talking about 180, 100 to $200 solution um, that does that headset. So I don't, I don't know if it's worth it. And, I, and again, I'm still on the, you know, on the border of whether those headsets worth it, like whether I really use it, the more I kind of play with it, the more I go, well, I might just end up using my open com or I might nowadays you can take this little, um, you can take, there's so many little converters here that you can use to to push mics into into stuff, so yeah, I'm not so. Still not when sure. you were using your analog converter, were you just going into the single jack headset and put on the yeah. on the Mac mm -hmm. Studio? Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. I've never, I mean, I've yeah. almost never used as a mic. Right. <laughs> like it's just it's like not. I, I, yes, but it does it. All right. Next question. 
Alexander Knight from Port Coquitlam, B.C., Canada. If you were to rebuild your studio and had the budget to do whatever you want, what would be the number one priority change for you? Go ahead, Alex. Well, one thing that I've learned over the last few years is that I will never, ever by choice use HDMI again. I absolutely hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. I don't mind. I don't mind HDMI. Um, to me, it would be space. Um, th- this is my mother's home. If, if, I'm sure most of you know. The reason I have this dumb door here and then all this space here is a multitude of things I have zero control over. But what I have really enjoyed is having this sort of ante room here. And you can't really tell, but there's a TV there. And then there's a couple of chairs over here. And to be able to get up and remove myself from like, you know, oh, here, I can show you real quick. From this, right? And to get away from all of that for, you know, a, a moment or sit back and wait for something to render, like it's really, and plus, I mean, photographically, it gives, you know, the depth and blah, blah, blah. But space, 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 space to me is, is the most uh, poignant representation of, of wealth. Like just to have a little space where you're not tripping over stuff piled on the floor and space. I would give myself a lot of space. Go CJ. I've been very fortunate from a timing perspective to go through this process of rapid iteration within the space that I'm currently in. While I've got about eight months down the horizon, I'll be moving and rebuilding this whole setup in a totally different place. The two things that I'm focused on is I'm getting an extra height of vertical space so that I can hang things without feeling quite so compacted, but also I want more Z-axis behind me because right now I'm limited. I'm, I'm fighting this battle of I want to have a, a nice bokeh, but I also want to be well lit. And right now what's lighting me is also lighting the background. And now I'm needing to, you know, crank down the aperture on the camera, which is making everything a little less milky. So, but yes, the definitely space so that I can pay attention to the, the lighting and the sound. And for goodness sakes, I'm not building it in the same room as my furnace and my water heater. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead, Bill. So for me, it comes down to the word friction. I, what I desperately like as I get older and, and change my practice is finding things that reduce friction. And you said space, and I agree with you. I, you know, I've famously said recently that it's so nice to be out of the voice booth. I've got a commercial voice booth in there. I did a lot of work in there, but to spend two, three hours in a voice booth is not the lifestyle that I really want. So to be able to get out into a full-sized office has been a huge release. So I'm right there with Chris on that. But I will say that the more space you have, the more you fill it with interesting things and the more interesting things you fill your life with, the more complex your life gets and the less frictionless you are able to move through it. Every time I can take a couple of systems and consolidate them into a device or a cleaner workflow, I find I lighten spiritually kind of a little bit. Too much complexity. And boy, I had complexity when I had the the studio in the old place with, you know, I, I famously said I had a hundred Edison outlets and they were almost all in use all the time because every time I added something, I just left it plugged in. And I had so many things that it was a, a weight. I knew how it all worked. But that's what I want less of. I want less weight from complexity if I can find it effectively. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, I would do a number of things. Get some, uh, uh, you know, high volume, low velocity HVAC so that I could have a temperature controlled room because that's important. I noticed on Twit yesterday that you were on, Alex, you know, two of, two of the members were really sweaty. It must have been very hot where they were. The room temperature was high. They were very shiny. They could have used your magic uh, uh, oil removing uh, uh, wipes. But uh, I would also move, I have my mixer and my um, ATEM on my right, which is where my mouse hand is. So I can't use the mouse and switch and even see because the mouse pad's kind of blocking the view of those things now. I came in have to reach around the mouse pad to hit the buttons. I'd move them over onto the left so I could mute with the uh, mute buttons on the uh, 
on the mixer instead of having to use the mouse to mute the uh, uh, zoom muting. And like I say, comfortable air, and I would not have windows all around that affect my lighting during the morning as the sun comes up and changes the balance of everything in the room. Yeah, I, I, I was suggested, I think here or a Mac break that I use blackout for, I have these windows that go up like 20 feet on one side that are really problematic because I have to tear half my ha my room apart to get to them. The ones that actually make a difference, which are the ones at the top, of course. Um, and, um, you know, I'm playing right now with my, you know, I tried these darker shelves on the front. I'm probably going to go ahead and replace those. I I am going to get the more expensive brick. I was going to get the, thin, the, the, the faux brick that was really thin, um, but the problem is, is that when I switched to 2.8 aperture, I could tell the difference. At 1.4, which is what I'm at now, I couldn't tell the difference. It's just a wash back there. But I could tell when I closed it up. And the reason I'm, that's important is because I want to move my camera to a zoom lens. And so I wanted to know what it looked like at, at 2.8 because that's probably where my, my zoom will end up. And so, so I started to think, you know, I th thought through that. Now, right now, it just looks really janky when you walk into my office. I mean, it works well here, but like I've got moving blankets and everything else. Um, I kind of want to build this into what looks, I think I kind of know what I want now. And I'm kind of thinking about like, how do I make this look a little bit more spaceship? Like, <laughs> like just like it's all like laid out the way I want. Um, a, uh, you know, a new new desk um, that I want to build with Chris at some point, like where we, I've kind of working on the designs. And what I'm probably gonna do is print a bunch of stuff in between, just as little in-between things where I can print it all of little pieces that kind of lay things out the way I want them to be laid out just to see if I like it and then build that in, you know, build that out with some nice wood. Um, so, so anyways, I have a nice little desk that has all the things kind of mounted to it. Um, you know, so I've, I'm getting closer. I do like the fact that I've left it this long kind of rough so that I keep on moving cables around and moving items around, um, you know, because once you start building the infrastructure for it, you're kind of pouring concrete into the idea and you, you know, it's not, it's definitely not going to change after that. So, so I'd rather build little things that, that kind of prop things up in the place that I want and see if I really like that before I start like building something like the desk that if you look at the final cut desk that was used um, in the final cut virtual user group on, if you um, pixel Gory, one thing you'll notice is how many times that desk changes. <laughs> like, like it's not, it wasn't the same desk. We built three of those desks, I think. And we just kept on refining it. And it was a fair bit of work to build each one of them. So go ahead, CJ. I, I'd be curious to ask the panel, what is, if, if there is an, a go-to for a visually pleasing acoustical treatment? Because I've got, you know, a little foam. What was the company we had? Got the we had the company. Uh, uh, the Canadian company, yeah. Uh, we had a company on and I just, I was trying to think of it off the top of my head only a couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe a month, uh, well, I, a couple of weeks in my head, could have been a month ago or two months ago, um, that, man, they, they have, that's, if I was going to build something, I'd be using their acoustical tiles. And I don't know if someone can throw that. Because you get the, in, the budget starts to, when you get pretty acoustical treatment, the budget goes way up. Yeah, the budget is higher, you know, and so it definitely, um, you can build things. I mean, the bottom line is, is that I have, I have a friend that built some really nice, um, you know, uh, sound traps that basically, I mean, all he did was he, he took a two by four and he put fabric on the front and fabric on the back and put just, you know, I think it was just a, a variety of insulation or whatever on the inside of it and definitely did a great job at it. Um, and he just had these big, um, uh, you know, four by eights and it, it definitely made the room work a lot better. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, I can't, again, I can't think of the name of the company that we had on. And I Prime I Acoustics. Prime Acoustics. Yeah, Prime Acoustics. They're the ones that make the shiny ones that look really nice. Um, and so it's something to think about. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Jason. Is that what you're going to no, say? No, that's what I had, Prime yeah. Acoustics. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. I use Prime Acoustic panels in my studio here. They look really nice, but more importantly, they do an incredible job too. Yeah, the little the thing on the back end that they make that that kind of grabs you know they put this this kind of circular pattern on the back of them that they had figured out makes it also impacts the quality of the diffusion um anyway so yeah prime acoustics is, is something that i'm looking that i mean i knew that i was going to go back and look at for them i also right now I, i'm using um uh maker pipe which is great I'm on the outer edge of what you can hang on on a on EMT rail, like it's all bowed a little bit, you know. And so my next version of it is um, to get speed rail. And what I was thinking about with speed rail is just putting in the corners. And then I thought about it, and I 
I may truss it out and speed rail it a little bit. The only thing that I'm kind of leaning into is that the room that I'm in is high enough that I could put a, <laughs> I could put a place to take naps above me. <laughs> so I've been like, like there, there's, there's like a, like, how do I put something up there so I can just go up there and, and like have a little like afternoon. Like I need to think a little bit. And, Wait, and what's have a the heat profile? Because I used to have a two-story townhouse. I have an AC, I have an AC unit in the room and it's only for this room. So, oh, okay, so I can, I can, the, the room, we're now in the winter, so I don't have to do that. But, but often the, the room, I can keep at 60, I keep my room at 64 degrees most, most of the time. Uh, 64 to 68, it ranges between there. Um, so it's, uh, so I, I, it's, it's pretty frigid in here already. And it, you know, I can, I can keep up with it. Yeah, good, Courtney. There's this, I found this company called uh, Boswa Acoustic. Let me, uh, that is uh, got this uh, acoustical plaster. I've never heard of this before. Uh, that it, it apparently you can make it look very nice, and it looks like it has a solid surface, but it doesn't. It has uh, sound absorbing material in it. So that would be an interesting way if you want to keep a decorative look on your ceiling or walls. And what's it called, uh, Boswa? B a s w a acoustics. Boswa acoustical plaster. Oh, acoustics, there we it's go. The modern version of the old popcorn ceiling, which actually works really well. It I doesn't one in look this like room. that. It says, it says acoustical plaster is a type of wall or ceiling finish that is sound absorbing, uh, proper, that is right? disguised as a solid, smooth surface. I don't know how they do it. Yeah, yeah the, the, interesting. I, um, I, I'm always amazed that the more restaurants and cafes don't spend more time on acoustics because oh. they're, they're the din of a cafe or I, I was, at, I remember I was, I used to go to this restaurant in North beach in, in San Francisco and they, it was a low ceiling, about eight foot ceiling. And, it, and they had then hung, uh, these little, like, they looked like a 12, maybe eight inch or 12 inch. And they looked like rafter. They looked like just beams, but they were every two or three feet and they were acoustic tiles like they were just they when i touched them one time i finally had to know they were just foam you know that was up there and and then they had built this in and you would sit at a at a, the reason i went there uh one of the reasons i went there was that it you'd sit at the table and you couldn't hear another table next to you like it was just it was and it was just so magical to be able to go in there's really you go in and it's really crowded and you didn't hear anything and and i that's when i really learned like how important the acoustics are and there's some places I walk in and I can't hear anything like it's all sucked up and everything else. And I respect that. You <laughs> know, Like I feel like, okay, someone paid attention. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, this is something I run into a lot because I talk to a lot of restaurant owners that are looking to have live bands. They want a, they want a PA system installed there. You know, I, and I go to these restaurants and I say, well, you got a problem. First thing is your restaurant sounds awful acoustically. Yeah. And they never want to invest in the way the place sounds. So I said, okay, I'll sell you a PA system, but you've got a bigger problem yeah. here. And it's just like this becomes this cacophony. You've got glass yeah. and you've got tile and it's just, it's terrible. Yeah. There you go, Bill. I first noticed that in a great restaurant in San Francisco downtown called Sam's Grill. They had actually built their booths such that the backs of each four top went all the way up to the ceiling. It was the first place I was ever in where I really enjoyed a conversation with the people that I was with because we were isolated from all the rest of that. When they went to open plan, which has its own, you know, there's reasons. It's easier for wait staff to move around. You have to, you have less crowding. But with that comes this idea of a big open space that is horribly echoing. And I'm right there with you, Alex. It is a nightmare to go try to enjoy a fine meal when everything is cacophony. Every dish clanking into a glass is heard everywhere. My, as some people, my, my daughter and I uh, on Saturday mornings go usually to a cafe or we go to the farmer's market or something together. And, uh, and But one of our pastimes is we, we go to cafes and stuff like that. And we design, we have this, like someday we're going to build a cafe. I don't know if we'll build a cafe, but we talk about it. And uh, and like this weekend, she really wanted to go to one that was, it was raining. She's like, I want to be by a window, <laughs> you know, like like and have it raining outside, but not raining, you know, and, and, and this whole thing. And then we realized it'd be really fun to have a cafe that all the way around the edges you had, um, you know, just windows, you know, these hard windows that went around like this. And then you had, then you built like these semicircles with an opening in the center like this, you know, and, and then a semi round table so that you're all looking out, you know, these big picture windows, you know, out into the street, you know, out like this. And it's all, but if these windows, to what 
what uh, uh, Bill was talking about, that these went really high, you, it, would, it would all be this very quiet space and then the wait staff could come in here. And if you made this, this top area, like somehow be able to be, I know it's only a half circle, but figure out some way to make it um, some version of it, you could move it around a little bit. You'd be able to have this, you, you feel like you're just in this little space that had this little open window that you could look out onto the street or whatever. It, it'd probably, you'd probably put it somewhere that was, that was worth looking out at. But, but then, and then you could put tables in here, you know, that, that kind of thing. But the booths would be reversed which would not be a great experience for the wait staff, but it would be a great experience for the people that were sitting there. And sometimes you want to focus on the customer. Uh, go ahead, CJ. The one thing that I'm going to experiment with from a, and this is going to sound crazy, but I've seen it done and seen it dead in a room incredibly. You get a, a, a sheet metal wall panel that has a bunch of little perforations in it. And it has, and the profile of the panel mixed with all the little holes that kind of looks like this ends up, really deadening the room, especially if you put some foam behind it. Now, it sounds crazy because you've got, you know, a hard metal surface, but I'm going to, my next step is I'm going to line the room with some of these because I know a guy who makes them. <laughs> uh, it sounds good. All right. Well, we, we, we've done this a couple times where we did, like talk about designing our studios or what our studio looks like. We probably should do that over the next month because we, we're doing kind of a lot of these internal ones. So stay tuned for more of that. Uh, next question. Next question from Eric Price in Kansas City, USA. Did anyone notice that the beast cage used in the Apple event behind the scenes was for the iPhone 14 Pro Max? It was masked at 109, but visible at 120. Would rigging the old one just for the project answer why the 15 isn't yet available, as was asked during the breakdown? Good, Bill. Well, so what I want to speak to is there's a term in the motion picture industry called picture lock. And you get to picture lock, and at that point, unless something radically is crazy, you do not go back and mess with the picture because all the rest of the, the crafts are doing their work based on your picture lock. So I think with these new devices, there has to be an equivalent, which is the shape, the size, the 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 abilities of the thing has to be locked at some point because everybody else has to do their work based on that. So it wouldn't surprise me if the phone has to be locked for marketing purposes three, four, five months before it's actually you actually produce what the phone's going to be used with. So in that respect, it makes perfect sense that they had to use a, a 14 Pro Max, that they couldn't just swap out a new device with new I.O. and new software and everything else and expect everything to go right two weeks before the shoot. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, I, I didn't understand. Maybe I didn't understand the question correctly. Is because the cage they used of iPhone 14 Pro Max instead of an iPhone 15, or did they use a cage designed for a 14 Pro Max with an iPhone 15? Yeah, they used a cage designed for the 14 with the 15. So the cropping may be due to, you know, they could have easily machined out the, the uh, cage uh, to you know, avoid cropping or getting in the shot somehow, but I maybe the differences between those two things is where it was cropped in some I mean, cases, and not is because the prompter was mounted on some shots and it was not mounted on other shots, and it may have cropped into the scene, uh, so they had to you know zoom in a little bit I, in post. I think that I think that the form factor difference. I mean, this is the fourteen and the fifteen together, right? I mean, they are. From a case perspective, the only real difference is that the 14 has the switch and the 15, uh, the 14 has a switch and the 15 has a button, you know, the, that's, that's above it where the switch was. But outside of that, these are almost, I, I mean, these, the form factor between these two, these two things are almost identical. Um, so being able to put it uh, into a case, um, if you left it, just the little buttons over, everything else should fit. So I think that's probably why they did that. Uh, go ahead, CJ. And... When I first got the 15, I didn't have a case for it yet. So if I was going somewhere where I was worried I might drop it, I actually had the Apple leather case and I put the 15 in the 14's case and found that it was yeah. a little, just a hair smaller. So, but I don't know why Beast doesn't have smaller? their, 15 is just a, I mean, almost yeah, like imperceptible a, unless you put it in the other case. But I don't know uh, yeah, why it's, uh, it's Script doesn't have their uh, yeah, 15, 15 case maybe, out yet. 15 is maybe a millimeter shorter millimeter smaller all the way around that's what i'd say so it is it isn't a perfect match but man is it close uh next question next question comes from douglas carmichael in the pictures of the spheres front of house position 
Their house console is a LAWO MC2. What does the LAWO do that other live sound consoles don't? There is a Digico SD7 and a Quantum 7 for you too. Go ahead, Alex. Lava. Oops. So I haven't used a Lavo console. I know of them, but I just I'll speak more philosophically as somebody that does sound. A lot of the times, you know, you develop, you know, it's what you what you are comfortable with, what you're trained on. And whether or not the console meets your requirements for the workflow that you have, uh, I mean, the Lavo has a lot of similar features. You can, you know, if you uh, these days, a lot of people like to use Wave Sound Grid for uh, running p- plugins in a live environment. So you can do that with the Lavo. You can do that with the Digico systems. Um, so again, it has to do a lot with what are you used to, what are you comfortable with, and there's another factor too. You know, a lot of well-known sound engineers that do sound for big bands, they develop these very close working relationships with a lot of these companies, um, you know, and that also keeps them using the gear and these companies help them out, you know, and can provide backups when or parts when things go wrong. So I, I don't know what the relationship was with, with Lavo and the Sphere is, but maybe they help them out um, getting that gear there. So um, that's that's another factor too. Yeah, the um, uh, Mickey pointed out that it might have better integration with Ravenna. I don't know what they're using there at the Sphere, but I wouldn't be surprised. When you start getting into massive scale, uh, people start talking about using Ravenna over Dante just because of the flexibility of it and the scale of it. Uh, I don't think Ravenna makes sense for smaller studios. <laughs> I think Dante makes a lot more sense. But when you start getting in, into large scale with just thousands of channels and or or even large hundreds of channels, uh, Ravenna probably makes more sense. And so that might be one of the things. And I, I find that people who are using Lavos, they love them. Like, and, and, you know, it's like, why does someone drive a BMW versus a Mercedes? Like, they're they're both very good cars and you you like the way that the dials work on one versus the other. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, next question. From Eduardo Augustine in Panama, PA. Now that we are talking about these in-ear headsets, what would you recommend for a football referee? Limited budget. I've been using Rode Wireless Mic with headpiece. You know, the... Uh, the Rode li- wireless mic with a headpiece. Um, I'd be very curious as a referee if that's really working for you. Like, are they? That seems like a long throw for the roads. Um, you know, so the that's a that's. I'm assuming you're talking about the little road, road. You know, the little boxes that that a lot of us have used. Road goes. Yeah, road the road, road goes. That seems like it'd be a long throw for a road go. Um, you know, so I'd be curious at, at, at the quality of audio and how many times it breaks up when a body gets, like if the referee turns a certain angle, it seems like you'd lose it. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, road did make some VHF wireless mics. Maybe that's what he's talking about instead of the one point, you know, 2.4 gigahertz versions, which right. is what the goes are at. And uh, yeah, you line of sight on those things is notorious. So if they've got their back turned to the receive, you know, if the transmitters on the opposite side of their body as the receiver is, it's it's going to drop out. And if there are three or four, you know, guys in pads standing between him and the receiver, it's going to drop out. Unless you can have the receiver directly overhead in the stadium, so it's got clear line of sight to the refs all the time. Those higher frequency RFs are going to be a problem. You'd better better off with something that's multipath, uh, you know, that has uh, multiple receivers. Uh, to take care of the multipath cancellation uh, with multiple antennas. Next question. Samuel Nordvik from Norway asks, how would you compare a Starlink connection versus cellular connection in terms of internet jitter when doing WebRTC? Uh, I think that my, the problem that the Starlink that I have um, drops out for 45 seconds every once in a while just because it, it gets between satellites. And so so I that, that that's what worries me the most. I think if I was... It depends on on my coverage, um, but I'd be tempted to to um, have a star. I would be tempted to use cellular if the cellular was good, and it wasn't bonded. I would do WebRTC from a cellular connection. To be honest, you know, like I I think that it would um, if I if I was doing a show. If it's once it is, if I'm doing WebRTC, once I start bonding the cellular, it's going to be. I, we've never had that work very well. Like it's just always the jitter and it rearranges frames and does a lot of things that we don't expect it to unless we turn the buffer up because the RTC is really low. Um, again, the Starlink could work if, as long as I'm willing to lose it for 45 seconds about every hour, um, then it's okay. 
<laughs> you know, but but I haven't, and I haven't gotten perfect all the way around, but it's really hard. You'd be surprised at how hard it is to get a 360 view of the sky all the time. Um, you know, I, I thought, oh, that won't be a big deal. It's a big deal. Like, it's hard to find. Like, unless you're out in a desert, it's hard to find the whole sky, you know, and so then you end up with these dropouts. So that's been the problem that I've had with uh, with the Starlink. I have one. I have the first, not the first, second generation, but not, not the third generation. So I don't have the business one. So that's the that's the difference there. Uh, next question. Joaquin Matus from Imperial Valley, California. I've seen many Atmos mixing rigs with different models for monitors for the uh, left, center, and right compared to the surround rear and height. Is there a good reason for this, or would using the, all the same model of monitors be ideal? Go ahead, Alex. Well, I could also tell you I've seen lots of Atmos rigs with all identical speakers. I think for me, if if I were to build an Atmos rig, I would want all the same manufacturer for speakers. There's something to be said for system synergy. Yes, different, you can mix and match different brands, you can tune the room, you can calibrate them. Uh, but um, for me, I think I would prefer to have that. Um, so I think it comes down to a preference thing. G I like Genelec studio monitors quite a bit and they have an incredible uh, calibration system that with, with great software. So uh, again, to each their own, I guess. Go ahead, Courtney. You got to remember that Atmos was designed for theatrical uh, exhibition. So left, center, and right in a theater are coming through the screen. So they require different drivers and have to be higher energy drivers to make it through that screen and get full frequency response through the little holes in that screen, as opposed to the surrounds, which are a whole row of drivers down the side of each theater and then some overhead. Um, so that they're different, they're spread out uh, along the walls uh, and a single driver has to handle the center, a single driver has to handle the right and the left or usually a stack or a stack. But um, yeah, they're, remember they're designed to go behind the screen and in a home situation, you know, I guess you can tune them however your, the acoustics are in your room since you're not coming from behind the screen generally. Yeah, they, uh, almost every professional system I've seen all the at least all the one all the um speakers on the same plane are all the same speakers if not all of them except for the subwoofer of course or the lfe so the lfe might be a, a bigger box but the the ones on the plane all tend to be the same and then the up speakers might go smaller um you know but they can go um but or or they're the same as the ones that go around that's what i've seen and that's what we have built most of the time um and so that's i have not seen them mix and match very often. Uh, next question. Alexander Knight from Port Coquitlam, BC, Canada. Can the Blackmagic Design HDMI to SDI converter boxes do frame rate conversion like a decimator? Would be useful for getting some computer monitors working at 29.97. Right, go ahead, Courtney. Generally not. The Terranex might, but the most of the mini boxes don't frame rate convert. Uh, they will... Um, and they don't scale, I think. Most of them don't go from 720 to 1080, at least they didn't used to. Uh, they just convert from HDMI format factor and level factor to SDI and reclock. But they don't necessarily uh, change the frame rate at all. They don't buffer they... and change the frame rate. They didn't used to, and maybe they do now, but I haven't I... bought these in the last four years or five years since I've been buying decimators. Yeah, I think that the, the I think there's an up-down cross version of those that is what you're looking for. Uh, I don't think that the straight like $40 HDMI to SDIs will do 30 to 29.97. I don't think that they do those frame rate changes. I'm not 100% sure, but I don't I don't think so. Um, but the up down cross that that they sell does do that as well as the decimators. And I think the up down cross is less expensive than the decimators, but with a lot less features. Um, you know, the 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 downside of the decimator is the the latency. You lose a couple frames, two or three frames to go through it when you, when it does that. But the upside is, it's like a Swiss Army knife, and it's great to have at least one or two of them. Again, I do start to think about a permanent solution. If I start, I, I use decimators as throwdowns. Like I need it right now to fix it. I, if I if I have that problem, then I. I try to figure out how to fix it in a more permanent way, but cause I, mostly because I just don't want to use up my decimators. Um, you know, so so that's the other the other bit of that. 
All right. Well, we uh, there's a great set of questions from everybody uh, on our on our Q and A week. So all week, this is all Q and A all day. Uh, so uh, we're just taking a little little slower here, um, and uh, so great questions. And we slowed down a little bit. Let us know if you in the RFI or or anywhere here whether you like the slower format on these two hour ones where we're just you know just kind of cranking through the things at, at the pace that we're going through here. Um, and um, so, uh, but yeah. Great questions, great conversation. Uh, thank you to the panelists. We can't do this without you. I was surprised. At, I was like, oh, it's going to be a slow week. And then there were all these great panelists here today. So uh, so hopefully we'll have that throughout the week. The, the week. Uh, we'll have a lot of uh, good good panel discussions and, and, uh, and Q&A. And thanks to the incredible team that even on a holiday week for a lot of us in the United States are, are here making sure that the show goes 20, you know, every day, <laughs> not 24-7, but uh, every day, uh, 365 days a year. Um, we are, we have an incredible team that's actually making the show happen, uh, managing the show, uh, developing, uh, the software for the show. And we really appreciate everybody's contribution. Uh, we traveled 46,000 miles today. That's 75,000 kilometers. And that is 367 million bananas for scale. I almost, let's go jump into after hours. Hey Alex, on hey, Thanksgiving day, can we bring dessert and eat it on air? <laughs> sure, but it's in the morning. It's in the morning for a lot of us. I mean, if you want to bring dessert, it's going to be very. I have early. bananas on my cereal every. Maybe on Pumpkin Friday we'll have. Is universal. Friday we can have. Left. The best part it's is, it's like a perfectly good breakfast. I'm going to have. Friday is the leftover edition. I know. I'm going to have jambalaya and greens for a week. I love it. We're having 36 people at our at our house. We are right not. Here. That's why they call it Black six. Friday. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, it's, just yeah, it's me and my girlfriend. I can't wait. It's yeah, going to be the you know, best my, Thanksgiving ever. My parents in law are coming up, and uh, my, my wife's mother is an incredible cook. So I, I actually cook with her now, so I can take notes. Because my wife was not taking notes, I'm like, we have to learn all these things for. <laughs> so Doing three turkeys, three tri tips, and a ham. Awesome. No turducken. <laughs> 